Good morning. It's great to see you guys here. I'm Dean Frazier, and I'm so delighted to welcome you all to Columbia. Nursing's 2022 Helene Fuld Health Trust Innovations in Simulation Summit. It is our fourth summit and the first that we're back in person since 2019. So it is just amazing, actually, to be physically present with you all and get to connect. So it's also remarkable to be in the room with some of the country's pioneers in healthcare simulation. We have developers here. We have educators, users, practitioners, and more. And your work in preparing nurses, surgeons, dentists, and many others to provide the best quality of care for patients before they engage with real patients is really, really important. Simulation has always sought to bridge that gap between the classroom and that real life experience. An extended reality, we have some of that today, uh, also extends and strengthens that bridge. For the student, it's state of the art. Students love to come into the simulation lab. They light up, that's kind of their home in our building. And it's gonna help them be the best practitioners they can be. For patients, the most important part is it saves lives. And that is why we are here today. I want to thank the incredible Kelly Bryant. Kelly, stand up, I know everybody knows you. <laughs> the Assistant Dean of Clinical Affairs and the Columbia Nursing Helene um, Full Trust Simulation Center, and for making this day possible. It was a lot of work. What we're saying today was a lot of work that you put together. Um, thanks also for your team or any of your team here with us. Please stand. We want to recognize you. Stand up, Juan. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. I hope you've had a chance to meet them, and I also want to thank everybody else who helped out in today's event. Do we have our development team here? I know they've been, they're probably out doing their thing. Um, and um, especially Prexit David. <laughs> he is Columbia's Director for Emerging Technologies and Director of the Emerging Technologies uh, Consortium. He's been a tremendous partner in planning today's events. But before we get started with the program, uh, this is Veterans Day. I wanted to um, give a chance for any veterans we have to stand so we can acknowledge you all. Anybody? Don't be shy. Oh, I see a hand raised up there. Thank you. Thank you for your service. Thank you. OK, and now I'm going to turn it over to Brexit. Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Dean Frazier, for that introduction. Uh, I share the same sentiments. It's really amazing to see all of you in person again. Um, this is such a great event, and Kelly, I have to thank you for all the work you've done to corral the right groups of people. Um, and I think that's what's really important. Um, a quick way of introduction, uh, Parixit Deve, Senior Director for Emerging Technologies at Columbia University IT. I remember pre-pandemic, um, and it seems like a blur, um, but we started something called the Emerging Technologies Consortium. And that was a way to bring like-minded folks across the universities in different disciplines and domains to come together uh, to talk and learn about XR, or extended reality. Um, like many, I, I had really small knowledge of XR and everything that encompasses that. I remember having conversations with, our, with Stephen Finer, uh, who uh, has an amazing lab on campus, uh, who's been researching these technologies for the past more than 30 years now. Um, and just going into that lab and looking at all of the work that that team has been doing and experiencing XR, it was just an aha moment of this could really impact teaching and learning and research um, across universities, uh, not just Columbia. And there's really a bringing the ideas together and letting people experience these technologies was our first way 
of starting the conversation and finding our champions. Um, and so that small group uh, grew, uh, and we found our champions like Kelly, like Letty, uh, like Rob and David, uh, and all the other amazing folks who started coming up and also asking about some of these technologies and how they could utilize them. And so what my takeaway for all of you is if you're at that stage of discovering uh, and learning, that's a great stage to be in. Um, because what I hope that you all take away is look around um, and find your champions in this room, even if they're not from your institutions. Um, I also want to um, give a, a thank you to one of my champions that was not at Columbia, and that was uh, Randy um, at Yale, uh, who introduced me to some of the contacts uh, not only in, in, in higher education, but also in the industry. And developing a relationship with the industry was really also important because it, there was a two-way knowledge flow. They got to understand the needs of our institution, but we got to learn from them about the technologies that they were developing and how they see these technologies being utilized in the context of higher education. Um, and so it was a really great way uh, to learn and also have a dialogue with the industry about how we could co-develop some of these technologies. Um, and it's been a really, um, really a great endeavor to go down this route of looking at extended reality and these new technologies. We went from a small group to supporting 17 projects all across Columbia. Um, nursing has some great projects, and we have a great panel uh, a showcase that we are really excited to, sh uh, to highlight all of the Columbia projects. I'm really looking forward to that. We also have a, uh, a great line of other folks from different universities talking about what they're doing as well. Um, I also want to come up and uh, introduce uh, Kelly Bryant, who's been really amazing. She's one of our champions, uh, but she's also an innovator that's really moving the needle in these technologies, and we need people like her to move the needle. So, Kelly? Thank you. Thank you, Parixit. And I also just want to make another note. It, it took a village to put this together today. So I do want to acknowledge also Dr. David Kessler, who was part of the planning committee. David, stand up. Don't be shy. <laughs> Steve Finer. Steve, where are you at? Are you in the room? No, not yet. Okay, so I will say there was a, a conference planning committee also that helped put this day together. So welcome everyone to our fourth Innovations and Simulations Summit, again hosted by the Columbia School of Nursing Helene Fold Health Trust Simulation Center. So each year we have the task of selecting a theme, whether it's an emerging topic in simulation, a hot topic in simulation. So this year we decided to focus on extended reality. And for those of you who are not familiar with the term, extended reality is really the umbrella for augmented virtual reality and mixed reality. And although the effectiveness of XR use in healthcare has not been widely documented, it does have the poten potential to enhance education and delivery of the education we provide to our learners and increase patient safety. And we know it has many uses. We've seen it used in anatomy and physiology. We've seen it used for clinical skills and procedural training, communication and even empathy training, and even practicing caring for patients in complex scenarios. So as someone who's been in a simulation field for about 14 years, I have experience working with a lot of different modalities. We got the high fidelity mannequins, we got the simulated participants, we have the task trainers and the computer-based programs. However, as I start to explore use of XR in our nursing program, I, like many of my simulationist colleagues, we grapple with many questions that come along with implementing this sort of new, sort of new technology. And some of those questions are, you know, you may have some of these same ones. Which software program do we choose? How do I get it started and implemented in our curriculum? How am I going to pay for it? How do I sustain it? How do I know that this is a superior method modality versus some of the other modalities that we have? How am I going to evaluate its effectiveness? So we're going to answer all those questions today. No, I'm just kidding. Not today. <laughs> But at least we're going to start the conversations, we're going to discuss ideas. Um, so we want you to be inquisitive, ask questions, network. Um, and we're lucky today because we have the honor of having some of the leading experts in the field of XR. 
experts who have developed their own XR programs, they conducted groundbreaking research in this field, and they have also su successfully created their XR innovation centers at their universities. And we also have some wonderful vendors downstairs, so please make sure during lunch and during our networking reception from three to five that you go visit. We have Simex, we have OMS, we have HP, um, and we have Lumetto who are down in the atrium. Um, so I hope that you look forward to today's session as much as I am. And again, I don't know if we heard the housekeeping, but just a few housekeeping tips or information. Um, please, if you can, uh, put your phones on vibrate. If you have any questions or need any help, again, please see any of us from the simulation or the Columbia team. Glad to help you. And if you have to use the restroom, again, coming out of the auditorium and back behind where breakfast was is uh, where the bathrooms are located. So without further ado, I'd like to present our first, our first speakers. So we have Dr. Kimberly Hefia. Did I get it right? Okay. <laughs> and Dr. Asher Marks. And uh, just a quick bio. Uh, Dr. Uh, Hefia is an assistant professor of pediatrics and co-director of XRPs at Yale. For the past 13 years, her research is focused on the development, evaluation, and implementation of health education interventions for youth that utilize XR and game technology. She has led teams that have developed game interventions focused on topics such as e-cigarettes, alcohol and tobacco use prevention, HIV STI prevention and testing, empowering black teenage girls on their sexual health, bystander education, LGBTQ bullying, mental health, and school climate. Um, she's also here with her colleague, Dr. Asher Marks, who is a associate professor of pediatrics at Yale School of Medicine and practicing pediatric hematologist and oncologist. He is a director of the pediatric neuro-oncology and also serves as the director of the adolescent and young adult cancer program for Yale New Haven Children's Hospital and co-director of XRP at Yale. He is the director of the AYA program and has led to development of a virtual reality-based support group for adolescents and young adults with cancer. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome our speakers. Hi, everyone. Oh. Um, do we have a clicker? Or Is that a clicker? Okay, great, yes. Okay, okay, I gotta figure it out. Hi, um, Kim, my name is Kim. Um, we are gonna talk today about XR pediatrics or XRPs is what we are starting to all kind of grasp on to. Um, and I, I won't go through our introductions again because um, we just did a wonderful job of that, thank you. Um, but just a quick, another little piece of my background. So I've been developing games for about um, series games, game-based interventions for about 13 years. Um, and about five years ago, I really started getting interested in uh, AR, VR, and how we could use the immersive technology to kind of push the boundaries further in terms of what we were already creating. Um, most of the games that I create are behavior change games, so I, I tend not to use the word education because I like the idea of learning. Learning is something you do. Education tends to be something that is happening to you. Um, so when I think about um, game-based learning, um, it really is the opportunity to practice skills um, and less about uh, acquisition of knowledge and more about that skill-based training. Um, so I've been doing XR work for about the last five years, again, focused on uh, the pediatric population. Jump in. Don't have a, a ton to add. It was a great intro, and I appreciate it. Um, so I, I am a practicing pediatric oncologist, so I spend the majority of my time actually in the clinic. Um, while Kim's focus is really on behavioral change, my focus is more on actually using these tools in the hospital um, as, as actually clinical interventions. Um, so Kim and I, uh, kind of an, an interesting little anecdote that I think is really important for this, for this audience, we're both from Yale, and we met at Vanderbilt. Um, and what I mean by that was it was uh, 2020. It was a week before COVID hit in March. We were both giving a talk at Vanderbilt. We went to the kind of, you know, meet and greet the night before. And everyone was like, oh, you must be here with Kim. And I had no idea who Kim was. 
So they introduced us to like, you guys work a block away from each other. I thought no one else at Yale was doing VR. Um, and from that day forward, we started working together. Um, we realized that we had skill sets that complemented each other very nicely. Um, and that's where, where XRPs came from. And we'll talk about that in a, in a little bit. It's always interesting with two people, like the back and forth. We're kind of short, so that works well. Um, so XRP, so just a quick intro of what we do. Uh, we focus on the use of extended reality, so that's virtual augmented mixed reality within research, clinical practice, and pa patient family provider education, again, with that overarching goal of improving the health and well-being of, of youth and their families, too. Um, like Asher said, you know, we, uh, we, we are the, the, the leadership here, uh, along with our colleague, Veronica, who um, has been doing work at West, in West uh, Virginia. She came to us um, from University of West Virginia. She had been doing a lot of work in um, XR, cognitive psychology, and her job actually was to make people sick in VR, to try to understand where those boundaries are in terms of, of getting nauseated and sick in VR. So she came over too, and, and we've, we've been working hard to get this program up and running um, for the past year and a half, two years. Um, and then we also have a larger extended team um, from a lot of different departments within Yale, um, within pediatrics but in school medicine, but we also work closely too with um, um, outside of, of school of medicine um, in other departments as well. Um, and most recently too, we've been ex you know, extending that collaboration outside of Yale, um, which is another big goal of ours is again to, to get out of that silo, the silo within our department, within our school, within our university, and then just and broader. So we're working, for instance, we're working with the Chariot program out of Stanford on a project uh, most recently, and that's been, that's been wonderful. Um, here's some of the projects that we have um, started over this last year. Um, we're not going to have time to go through them all, um, so we'll, we'll pick a few that we're going to go through. But just in um, kind of in a summary, we have, uh, Asher's going to be talking about the social VR-based support groups that he's been doing um, and how that is, uh, not only he's been doing that with uh, youth going, um, that have cancer, but then also we've now expanded that with, into our LGBTQ group, uh, social VR social group, um, uh, social support groups have been wonderful for this group um, in the sense that um, when we think about avatars, right, you can actually be in an avatar that feels more like you or who you feel like you are inside. Um, even the technologies wonder we can modulate voices so you can even have a voice that matches how you feel. Um, so that is the work now we're at Yale Child Study, so, um, moving that work there. Um, I'm gonna talk about invite-only VR. Um, it's a project that I've been working on for several years, but vaping is still a problem with youth and now it's more so marijuana vaping. Um, and even fentanyl now is a concern with the devices. So um, we're now extending that project um, um, and, and bringing that statewide uh, to several school districts. Um, let's see, our alcohol harm reduction game, No Time Wasted. This is an AR game uh, developed for the Magic Leap. Um, rehashed is gonna be the new marijuana vaping, specifically you know, uh, building that out. Um, I put this in here, it's not a VR-based game, but it's a project we, uh, that I uh, kind of carried over you know, with my love of web-based games, a multiplayer game for HIV STI prevention. And um, we have a project funded by the CDC called Debugged. Um, Ash is gonna talk more about that, but it's an infection uh, prevention and control um, uh, intervention for NICU nurses and uh, uh, NICU parents and family members to reduce uh, the incidence of you know, infection spread in the NICU. And then uh, the year of the cicadas, uh, this is a, a game-based uh, experience around uh, the loss of a child um, over time and looking at some of those, those ideas around like anticipatory grief, long-term grief, um, uh, you know, complicated grief, a lot of those things, the ideas that kind of go with, can go with PTSD and, and the loss of, of a child. So, uh, but again, we are going to talk about this one, this one, and this one. And I'm gonna hand this over to Asher. 
So this, this is a graph that I, I love to look at. If, if you look at kind of the business side of VR, there, there's similar graphs out there that, that really show the incredible adoption rate of, of the technology and they compare it to adoption rates of things like color television, VCRs, internet, mobile phones, and, and they kind of go along slowly and then shoot right up and, and VR is right there. So, so that's kind of what, what we use to convince people in academia and industry that this is something worth looking at. Even more importantly for us in academia is this chart, which shows uh, publications of VR-based uh, papers kind of through time. And you can see this tremendous exponential growth um, occurring around 2009, 2010. Um, and, and we expect this to, to really just keep on going. Um, we decided to try to take some of this information, kind of look at this graph, and Look at it more from the perspective of, of the work that we do, being focused on pediatrics and, and extended reality. Before we really kind of planned out our center and what we want to do, we had to figure out what was already done. You know, what's worth doing, what's already been done, and what needs to be, to, needs to be expanded upon. So we've started this scoping review uh, probably about six months ago, taking much longer than we thought, <laughs> as, as, as they tend to do, and I'll show you why in the next slide. Uh, but what we're looking at specifically are virtual reality-based health applications for youth. So. What we looked at in terms of inclusion uh, were specifically peer review journal articles, publication years 2010 to 2022, English, youth under 18, uh, youth, youth must be the end user, and VR must include a head mounted display. The reason that we have this bolded is we found some remarkable results um, that I'll show on the next slide. But, but basically, as we started digging into this, our, our initial hits were huge. And as we actually looked at what people were calling VR, we realized a lot of times VR was simply um, a digital intervention. And, and so that first chart, chart, chart I showed you, that, that's accurate. Those, those were real VR uh, interventions, but there's a lot out there. When you start going through PubMed, it'll say virtual reality, and they're just talking about some kind of digital intervention. So something to keep in mind. Um, so the main areas of focus that, that we're finding, and I don't think this is going to come to a surprise to anyone who's, who's been working in this field, but pain distraction, anxiety, prep for procedures, uh, probably the biggest one out there. And, and I think it's, it's pretty easy to say the, the evidence is, is holding up, despite the fact that these tend to be kind of smaller trials. There's great evidence for it, and there are centers throughout the country who just are using VR day to day in their clinics uh, for, for these reasons. ADHD and autism, also a really big one, especially when we're looking at improvements in attention and communication skills. Uh, depression, anxiety, physical exercise, extra gaming, real big one, huge peaks in extra gaming around Pokemon Go. Those are starting to kind of come down a little bit and then go back up as we look at its use in VR. Uh, rehab balance, postural control. My PTs and OTs uh, over at Yale are really excited about these technologies and there's some great evidence in these fields. Uh, amblyopia treatment, and this is kind of the one where I always point at and say, look, if we're looking at an intervention that can be good for something, it can also be bad for something. If we're looking at something that can be bad for something, it could also be good for something. And, and the reason I put it this way on this specific topic is there's a lot of concern about how VR may affect vision of young kids. Um, and there's actually some good evidence for treating amblyopia with these head-mounted displays. What we're finding in terms of the qualities of studies, there, there are really very few, if any, large clinical trials with control arms, really no kind of phase three type studies, very few RCTs. A lot of these are pilots um, and, and just seeing, you know, can this work be done? Is this acceptable work? Um, and then some case studies. So here are hits. Um, and this is why it's taking so long. Initially close to 8,000 hits. We started with kind of four people reviewing and we just keep adding more people to help us review this. I think we're up to six or seven now. Um, and so every hit that we have needs to be reviewed about three times total by two different people each time. That's like six reviews for every one of these papers. Um, 5,000 have already been found to be irrelevant, whether that be due to age or it being not a true VR intervention. Uh, 2,000 have gone a full text review. Of those 2,000, we've gone through about 1,000. Um, and I'd say at least half of these have been thrown out because it's not true virtual reality as we're defining it. So, so you know, one thing Kim and I are talking about doing, and, and there's some talk about talk with the FDA about this, is what defines virtual reality. Really basic questions um, that we have to kind of step back, um, step back from, and, and, and look at before we move forward with a lot of our work. So I'm going to jump in here, and I'm going to talk a little bit about the work that I've been doing uh, with social VR. Um, this began, believe it or not, pre-COVID, but was you know a really um, you know kind of big breakthrough, something that was fantastic to, for us to use during COVID. Um, when I was hired at Yale about 10 years ago, they hired me to run the pediatric brain tumor program, and, and due to the fact that I was the most recent hire, I was also the most 
you know, junior and, and, and youngest one there. Um, and so they asked me to do the adolescent young adult program too, and I said, sure. So the, the lowest hanging fruit for this population, adolescents and young adults with cancer, um, is psychosocial support. Um, we know that support groups are valuable. We know that our patients were asking to attend support groups. We also knew that none of them ever showed up. Um, and so the question was, was why? Um, and in talking to them, they didn't want to be in hospital after hours. They didn't want to be seen when they're not feeling their best. Um, they um, had real life you know, outside the hospital. They were working, they had families. So there were a lot of reasons. So we started looking at potential solutions, things like Zoom, things like online forums, um, things like just you know, conference calls. Um, there was very little interest in all of these. Zoom was their parents' tool. Uh, conference calls and telephone were their grandparents' tool. Um, <laughs> they, uh, it wasn't exciting for them. And, and so we started thinking about VR. This was around 2018-19 um, when we had Oculus Go's, so we did not yet has, have six DOF headsets, but we did have something that was self-contained. I knew at the time it was going to take a long time to run this through IRBs and protocol review committees, so we decided to get started. Um, eventually, we ended up on this software platform uh, called, uh, this is with the, something called the Glimpse Group, which is actually out of New York. The piece of software is, is, is Fortel Reality. This is kind of the initial software we used, and I'll tell you right now, the avatars are looking much better than this. It's something to put a big focus on, but this was the initial stuff. And why I like to show this video, even though it's, it's not dramatic, it has in it everything we actually needed. We wanted six stuff. We wanted patients to be able to kind of move in, move out for that nonverbal communication. We wanted really good hand motions, again, for that nonverbal communication. We wanted really good 3D audio because we have these patients sitting in a circle. So you needed to know where they were sitting, where that voice was coming from. And we wanted things fairly basic. When we first went to this company, you know, this is a, a young kind of startup and they wanted to show what they could do. So like, great, we've got a great demo for you. We're gonna put you on the moon or in a building, on the roof of a building, like, no, 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 slow down. We need the basics. We need just a nice, calm room to show that patients will respond, attend, um, and enjoy it. So early challenges, I'm gonna go through a little bit quickly here because I'm taking up more time than I thought. But the bottom line is this had to get through the typical PRC, typical IRB. PRC, I, I sat on this committee. This was an oncology PRC. Early phase studies moved through in about 15 minutes. My study took nine months. Um, mostly because they just didn't know what they were looking at. They didn't understand the technology. Um, they wanted a lot of safety measures in place. Our protocol went from six pages to 36 pages over that period of time. It was a great experience, but, but excruciating, really hard. Once that was done, it flew through the IRB. We we're about to launch the night before I get phone calls from IP lawyers and HIPAA lawyers, and it was delayed another nine months. So this stuff is hard to start with because it, it hasn't been done. So people are trying to wrap their heads around it. So, so I guess my lesson here is take your time with it. Know it's going to take a little while. We launched the trial. We looked at uh, resilience uh, as well as depression and anxiety. Um, and we're working on the manuscript now. I can tell the average age was 19, meaning age 19. So most of these patients around the age of 18 to 22. Most common diagnosis ALL. So we were getting kind of the most common diagnosis we would expect in this age group. 10 males, five females, one transgender female, which completely changed the shape of where we're headed with this. So that's been exciting. I'll get to that one second. 72% attendance, right? This is the number that I love to quote. We had 0% attendance, right? And that sounds dramatic. And anytime I give this talk in industry, oh, nah. but the truth is, we couldn't get any of these kids into support groups before this started. And, and now they're coming and they're asking for more. Um, and then finally, significant improvements in resilience using that CDRS survey. So that was huge for us. Resilience is a big topic right now. Um, I could go through these quotes all day. I love the anecdotes, but I'm going to skip it so we can get some more exciting stuff. And I'm going to head it, hand this over to Kim right after this slide. So this is, this is the next step I was talking about. We're working with a gender diverse uh, clinic um, over at Yale now. Um, these are patients that identify as transgender or somewhere else on the spectrum. Um, and as Kim mentioned, these are new avatars. This is using a a uh, company called Ready Player Me. These are avatars that are really kind of primed for the metaverse. They're designed to be able to be cross-platform, cross-application, um, and really highly detailed. Um, so this is what we're using now. I'd recommend checking out um, Ready Player Me website and make your own avatar. It's, it's a lot of fun. I'll go to Kim. Am I on the time as well? Sorry. No, we're good. I think we're good. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna talk about uh, invite-only VR, vaping prevention game. 
This was a game that was um, funded by Oculus Education back in 2017. Um, and we developed this in 2018 to bring into schools. Uh, it's, it's received a lot of attention. Um, we, were a, we were recognized as a Forbes Top 50 game in 2019, uh, and we won, um, you know, several several game uh, series game awards. So I'm really pr I'm really proud of this for what it was. When I play it now, it's kind of cringy because so, because the technology just changes so quickly on this. But um, so we developed this game with um, uh, input from about 100 teens. So we did focus groups, we did interviews, we did a ton of play testing. Uh, teens were really involved from the very bottom up. Even in this little kind of uh, clip here, you know, we have an environment of a school where a kid is vaping in the back of the classroom. It sounds like that would never happen, but that was the number one thing that we were hearing from kids is that kids are vaping in the back of classrooms. You know, they put their head down and blow the smoke in the, or the vape into their, into their, um, their the, you know, down below, and, um, or under their desk, and, and teachers didn't know, or teachers just weren't aware, and they could, you know, plug them, the USB, all their stuff into the, the USBs and into their computers or on the outlets, and, and there would be like 10 of them in the back of the classroom and teachers had no idea what they were. So um, it first started with the develop, it was developed for the Gear VR. Um, and as soon as we started developing, the Oculus Go came out. And as soon as the Oculus Go came out and we did this, the Oculus Go is now um, not available, right? It's been discontinued. So the game is just sitting, we're getting ready to fix the game and port it to the Oculus Quest. But it's just a reminder of how slow research goes and how tech fast technology moves. Um, and that's a bigger methodological issue, I think, that we need to think about in terms of how we do studies and, and um, RCTs and, and think about implementation, uh, how we can be, keep on top of the technology as we're doing these kind of, these kind of studies. Uh, it's a narrative-based game. You're a kid, you're a freshman in high school, and your friends are pressuring you to get this invitation to a, a party, a senior party. Uh, you have to get it by the end of the day. Um, if you see here, Sean on the right, he's the senior. He's throwing this party. He does not know you exist, but you have health class together because he's flunked it like three times, and he needs to graduate. So you follow him out of the classroom to the bathroom because you know he vapes in the bathroom. And you, you have to kind of, you have to, to um, you have to get through those kind of situations, right, and still save face, right? So this idea of like, no, I don't vape, then that's not going to get you with the cool seniors, right? So you can, helping kids try different ways to get, you know, to say no and, and practice refusal skills. Um, the, the, we also used, used um, voice recognition software, which was great uh, because we like this idea instead of just, you know, a lot of games, we just click through responses, voice recognition software, our kids can actually speak their responses, avatars, are, you know, you're, immerse, you're in an immersive environment, avatars look right at you, and they respond based on what you said. So they, we had this idea to make it a little stickier when you're practicing things, right? Um, so it's a great place to practice skills. Uh, here's just some of the art. We worked with a, a wonderful um, uh, artist that we worked with the local schools, went in, took pictures of the environments in the schools, and then the um, artists were able to recreate that in terms of um, really believable environments within the, within the game. Um, we brought this game to about 285 students um, within the Milford, Connecticut School District. So we were in three different middle schools, and we, were, we enrolled 285 participants, which was great. Our goal was 300, so we, we did fantastic there. Um, kids played the game on average. It's about a two-hour game. They didn't do it all at once. We would come back every, you know, and, and do the game. Um, and then we followed them for six months to see if playing a game could not only, you know, change some of those psychosocial factors related to behavior change, but were they sustained six months later? Um, and here's just our demographics. You know, it was pretty even between male and female in seventh and eighth grade. Um, in talking to schools now, as we're planning to move this game into uh, three school districts um, in Connecticut, uh, principals and school staff are saying, no, we actually need you in fifth and sixth grade. Um, so that's something we're considering now is, is how to adapt this even further for, for younger students, because that's where they're seeing even more vaping and marijuana use in school now. Uh, this was a, not a very diverse population, but at the time, again, this is 2018, vaping was very much a suburban, you know, kind of a, in the wealthier school districts kind of problem. Um, so Milford kind of hit that perfectly. And also, the, um, Netflix had actually made like a, a movie, uh, um, 
not a movie, but like a, a part of a series. They were at Milford School District was a full entire episode because they were the vaping problem was so big there. So they, they have a Netflix show on them. That's that was also a great reason to get in there. Um, so compared to the control group, um, you know, of the 285 uh, kids that we had in the study, we did see greater improvements in e-cigarette knowledge, nicotine addiction knowledge, perception of e-cigarette harm, which was really important, because not understanding that there's just water vapor, right, that there's a lot of nicotine often in, in um, vaping. Uh, perceptions around nicotine addiction, you know, this idea, I'll just quit whenever I'm never going to, I can't get addicted. Um, and social perceptions about e-cigarette use, like it's really, you know, it's really interesting that kids, if you say, how, how many of your friends vape? And they will say, oh, you know, like three or four. But then when you do a study, you know, and ask all the students how much you vape, you only have a couple kids that actually do vape in like seventh grade. So the kids have this perception that everyone's doing it. Everyone's having sex, everyone's drinking, everyone's vaping, but in reality, that's not true. So sometimes it's better to kind of flip that narrative on kids and say, not, you know, actually not many people do this. It's not as cool as you think. Um, so uh, in terms of, we had great uh, early outcome data, which, which was really exciting. It's gonna build us up to a larger studies um, um, moving forward. Um, but two of the things that I thought were the best things that we came out of it were um, one that, you know, we had nearly 100% of kids play and finish the game, a two-hour intervention in VR. Amazing. We didn't have any issues with the technology. We didn't have any kids quitting because they got nauseated or got sick. Um, so it, it was in terms of can we do this, can we bring it into schools, and will kids play it, and will kids learn anything? Yes, they will. And so it's, for me, it was very confirming that this is definitely a great way to get um, some of this really kind of not so fun topics into kids and, and build it around a narrative and let them explore. And in terms of their experience, uh, they also, you know, enjoyed playing the game. They really felt that the virtual reality simulated their real world, which was really important. We really wanted them to feel like they were in a real place. Um, and then they felt responsible for the decisions they were making in the game, which we want to see that translation into real world. So how am I doing on time? Great. Okay. <laughs> so we're now moving, like I said, we're going to move this into rehashed, invite only VR part two. This is going to focus on marijuana use. Um, so we're working on that now. This is funded by the, um, the Department of uh, our Public Health, Department of Public Health in Connecticut. Um, and uh, one exploratory aim, which I'm, I've been excited about this for years, I'm so excited we get to do this, is really look at the, the biometric data. So looking at um, eye tracking, heart rate, some of these simple biometrics uh, to see if we can actually identify at-risk players just through their gameplay. Um, because we know that there's a lot of really strong evidence around eye tracking and addiction, uh, nicotine addiction in adults, but what can we learn about how kids play and are, will that help us to identify kids that are at risk early on um, in, the, in the sense of th this will help us to adapt more of a tiered intervention using machine learning while they play. So if you've got a kid that is not really, uh, he's I have really low intentions to use, really has never used, doesn't really plan on using um, um, marijuana or e-cigarettes, you're not gonna to spend a lot of time talking about resources and how to talk to your clinician or a trusted adult about getting help, right? But if you can pick up on some signals that a kid has tried, um, or is actively using marijuana or vaping, then we can uh, shift that, that intervention to be more focused around supports and, and uh, what addiction looks like and ha have them practice talking to someone um, within their school or community. So I'm um, really excited about uh, moving forward with that too. And I'll turn this one over to you. So this is a, uh, a very new project. Uh, we just started in collaboration with I'd say over a dozen uh, other folks over at Yale um, that, that really extend into uh, our simulation people, our infectious disease people, some really high level grant writers. This, this is funded by the CDC. Um, and our job, Kim and my job, is, is to improve infection rates in the NICU um, using developing technologies. Um, so this has been a blast. This, this picture I love. This, this picture just shows Kim's talents and the value of um, of, of uh, visual uh, augmentation here. So, so this, this grant was about to go in. We had, it was literally like five minutes of deadline. Kim's like, we need a picture. So she pulls up a photo from our NICU, throws some Photoshop filters on it and some green gloves, and there we go. We've got the picture that's 
represented this project moving forward. Um, and so this actually is one of our NICU bays. And what they have found in the NICU, particularly after remodeling the NICU, the NICU went, underwent a remodel about five years ago now, where it was made to be more welcoming, less clinical, um, more warm, some, some private rooms here, great for parents, and, and people love it. The problem with it becoming less clinical was that people were not thinking of it as an NICU anymore, and so they were being less cognizant about infection control. Um, if you talk to our, our infection control uh, experts, they were seeing only about a 24% compliance rate with hand washing in parents. Um, when parents were approached, they weren't all that interested in changing the behavior. There, there have been many ways that they've tried to fix this, and it just hasn't been helpful. They suspect the reason you know, for it is, again, this less clinical nature of, of the NICU. It used to be you would walk in, solid, wood, solid uh, linoleum floors, easy to clean, sterile, smelling. Um, there were actually big sinks when you first walked in. Really, you know, clearly, you're coming in here, you're going to wash your hands. That's all gone. Um, they tried implementing UV boxes for cell phones. Nobody wanted to use them. So they've really been struggling with driving home the importance of, of infection control in a NICU setting with a premature baby. So, so the goal here that, 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 that we're tackling is to try to show families as well as um, people that work in the NICU, nurses and ancillary staff, how infection actually spreads. Really kind of, you know, scare them a little bit. And, and so we're, we're really kind of debating two separate interventions here, or, or, or two ways to do this, this intervention, and that's either VR and AR, VR or AR. And that brings up some really interesting topics around those technologies and, and when is best to use what and what technologies we have available. You know, if, if we could do whatever we wanted, if we had hardware that's probably going to be available in a year or so, you know, I think we'd look at the AR model. We would, you know, have patients put on a head-mounted AR display as they enter the NICU and start touching things and seeing where that infection is spreading, where you're actually spreading bacteria. We then have them do the same thing, go through, have some visual cues in the NICU through the air glasses as to where to wash your hands, how to actually do it better, and then assess and see if that behavior has changed. You know, I, I don't know if we'll be able to, to, to get that technology up and going quick enough, so we're going to be starting with the VR model. What the VR model is going to let us do is let this be done from anywhere. You know, parents can learn to do this before the child's even born. Parents can do this from home. Staff can do this from home. Um, and we'll actually be kind of recreating the exact NICU and, and with the same idea. As, as they kind of go through the NICU and touch things, they see where infection spreads, when they do sanitize versus when they don't sanitize. Um, and so we're hoping this will, this will make, finally make an impact in some of the infection control issues that we're having in our own NICU. This I'm going to talk a little bit about where we're heading with XRPs. So we've talked a lot about the current projects that we have. Um, we are trying to be as forward-looking as possible, which, which can be a blessing and a curse. Um, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we want AR. It's not quite there yet. There are ways that we can kind of simulate these technologies before they're actually available. Um, and we've been working with Meta quite a bit. Um, they are helping us uh, build an actual lab, which we see in the upper left, which we are incredibly excited about, and we hope to have everybody over soon so we can all hang out and talk there. Um, and part of that lab is going to involve this OptiTrack prototyping system. And, and what this is, this is a motion capture system. Um, it's it's kind of what you see in Hollywood, but you don't need those balls. You don't need special suits. These cameras can pick up people within the area and almost immediately kind of turn those into digital avatars. Um, and this is going to let us really kind of simulate AR and VR. Think beyond the head-mounted display, which we're not sure is really safe for kids, so we can kind of start doing immersive technologies without the head mounts. We can include haptics, high-fidelity spatial audio, which I'm only recently very sold on. It's remarkable what spatial audio can do in terms of convincing the brain that it's in a setting that it's not. Um, and really close body movement monitoring, which I, I think our, again, our physical therapists and even occupational therapists are very excited about. We can have much more high fidelity uh, tracking, which will help us with OT as opposed to just the PT we've been able to do before this. Uh, yeah, so as Asher just mentioned, you know, um, five minutes. Okay, so as Asher just mentioned, you know, uh, and I'm sure maybe some of you are thinking this, like what about the concerns with putting kids in XR, right? What about putting them in, in HMDs? Um, 
So, you know, we're at this very weird place right now where we don't, we think that, you know, the value obviously of the clinical applications and the interventions that we're developing um, are important for kids, right? And we should not exclude kids from those experiences, um, especially if we know that they're helping, especially Asher's work when we have kids that are not able to get into support groups, but because of VR, they can, right? This is, this is really powerful stuff. But we do have to be uh, thoughtful about some of the concerns that, that are out there, and, and we are always mindful of that. Um, again, there's no consensus on age recommendations for um, AR, VR. Uh, um, headsets yet. Most will say 13 and up. There's really no science or reasoning behind this. This is more just uh, um, industry trying to protect themselves. Um, they will, all, some will say, you, you know, kids can use them, but they have to have parental supervision. Um, and as of November 14th, actually, Meta um, has said that no longer you can um, uh, apps uh, that have accounts, no more apps for kids under 13, which we know that failed miserably with social media. Um, accounts anyway. So we'll see where that goes, but Lisa's sending the message that kids really need to be supervised. Um, so the research data on the safety of XR and youth is sparse. The technology we know is still new, it's constantly evolving. Uh, as a reminder that the headsets were developed for adults, right? These are, they're heavy enough on adults. Imagine put these, in, these on young children. We have to worry about neck strain. We have to worry about postural control. Um, you know, there's a lot we have to be thoughtful about. Um, we have to be concerned about how XR may impact the developing brain. Um, yet, you know, when we think about kids, they may not be able to discern yet between reality and fantasy, right? We have younger kids are still at that place where, you know, Santa Claus is real. Um, what happens when you're immersed in an, in an environment that isn't real, but we're trying to, trying to help them understand the difference between reality and fantasy. Um, fine and gross motor skills are still developing. You know, hand tracking, again, uh, this was developed for adults. Hand, if we know with kids, their fine motor is just not as, as up to par as adults, so we have to be thoughtful about that. Um, and again, like Asher mentioned, the, the concern about vision. Um, social VR, we have to be concerned, again, for online safety, uh, similar to social media. We, you know, we didn't think about this early on with social media. We have to be thoughtful now. Um, Children are not monitored well when they are in VR. Parents can't see what they're looking at, or kids are coming home from school and putting on those headsets, uh, logging into their parents' accounts, and, and getting into all kinds of social apps, and that's a concern. Um, there is filtering software, but I don't know if anybody has kids that nowadays, they, as, you know, as early as five, I've seen kids get into iPads and go and change settings, right? Kids know what they're doing. Filtering software is not necessarily gonna change anything. And we can't expect the children to navigate safely on their own. And then also, we also always have to be thoughtful about that, that socioeconomic um, divide. And, and um, we have to be thoughtful about those that are at risk anyway for being bullied um, and experiencing racism and harassment. Uh, there's always going to be that. And so we have to be very, very mindful about um, kids being in situations um, and how to cope with that and help kids prepare for that and what to do when they are there. Um. All right, so to wrap this up, I'm, I'm not gonna go through everything we, we went through. We went through a lot, but the, uh, one big take home I, I think that we haven't nailed down is when to use XR. And whenever someone comes to us with a, a new project that they wanna put in VR, my first question is why? You know, we, we have turned down plenty of projects because XR is just not any, adding any value to it. And I, I think that, that as we move forward, we have to make sure this isn't seen as a gimmick, that we're only doing things that are value and, and, and evidence-based, um, and, and really think about uh, what we, why, we, why we're doing it. You know, these are expensive technologies to so develop a new piece of software, very basic piece, we're looking at about a quarter million dollars. Um, and if we screw this up too many times, people are gonna stop paying attention. So we believe in it, but it's gotta be tested and, it, and it's gotta be proven. That's it. Thanks, everybody. All right. Wonderful presentation. You guys are doing extraordinary work. Oh, my goodness. So now it's time for question and answer. Uh, so if you have any questions for Dr. Hafia or Dr. Marks, please, if you can just come to the mic and feel free to ask any questions. Great presentation, good work. Uh, so did you have 
people on staff that built the software? Did you work with companies? How did you go about that whole development, testing, rollout process? So for many of these, I've learned to be really scrappy. So finding whatever talents we have in the group that we're working with. Um, but I'm also very fun uh, fortunate. My husband has a prototype company using game technology, VR, AR, and it's in our basement. So um, he does a lot of the programming, but you know he's a He's the computer programmer, I'm the, the scientist, the researcher, uh, the behavioral interventionist. So it's a lot of going back and forth. So our team, and because oftentimes we are scrappy, we're doing a lot of the wireframes on our own. We're, we're making, doing the audio on our own. We're, we find artists, we're doing the art on our own. So, um, but then we have, you work with uh, Fortel, right? I work and with that's, Fortel, yeah. yeah. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for the presentation. The question I had is that you alluded to it at the end that the, you, know, you want to do it for the right reasons and not for the gimmicks. And I'm just wondering, what are the, the reasons, or can you articulate the reasons why to really utilize XR for, a, for in particular parts of medical education as opposed to other modalities? Sure. So in, in, in terms of medical, I mean, there, there are a bunch of reasons depending on the application you're looking at. But, but if you're, you're asking about medical education in particular, for me, that's stickiness. Right in, in in medical education, we, we have the you know the the old saying "see one, do one, teach one." Right, and and to see one, do one, teach one, that one has to be happening in the hospital at that time, right? And and what that's saying is, you know, it's capturing the concept of emergent immersion and physical doing, and and I think XR really gives the opportunity to to do that and practice these things without having to you know either put patients at risk, which we really do, um, or have that opportunity occur organically. Thank you, Rashawn and Kim. That was such a great presentation. I have a question on the OptiTrek prototyping that you're working with Meta. Um, that sounds super fascinating. Can you talk a bit more about that, unlike the, some of the technical details that you're working through right now? No. <laughs> <laughs> we're still figuring we're it out. About to sign NDA. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're still figuring it out. So, so the way that it's going to look is we're looking at probably about a nine camera system that will be hanging from the ceiling um, with some pretty uh, powerful hardware attached to it. Um, if you have a person within that kind of square area of the cameras, they then appear on the screen. Um, the very basic software, from, from what I've seen, we've got our unit coming actually any day now, so we'll, we'll have a better sense of this soon. But on, on the, the demos I've seen, you know, they will appear on the screen and you can really kind of work with their digital avatar directly. You can have them in a virtual space within the screen. With them, within the space, you can then have monitors around that space so they see where they are. So, you know, the immersive effect is not always there as much as it would be with an with a HMD. Um, but you can start working out how your application is going to look moving forward. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Good, how are you? Good, thank you. So I've worked alongside the Red Cross and other companies who have started to use VR, especially when it comes to certifying for CPR training and advanced CPR training. The one barrier that I noticed with the XR is you are able to tell people what to do, chest compressions at a certain level, but they're not actually able to get to the patient to demonstrate that skill. What advances do you see later on in XR that will allow people to do that? Yeah, well, I, I, I can get to the first part of your question because we actually just saw a, a, a VR demo of somebody practicing uh, CPR and they actually had a, a dummy in front of them with a headset and they were doing it. We were like, why do you have the headset on? You don't even, you know, it's right there, you're practicing. So that was like a good example from that last slide of like, do you need XR? Um, I don't know. I, I you know, the, it will be amazing to see what is next in technology. We're definitely not there. I mean, you, you can get some haptic feedback. That's still not just giving that that tactile feeling, and you're not feeling the pressure, and you're not, you know. So I, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I think it's going to be a it, while. Is it possible to project an image so that when people, so you you have a fake, well, you have a patient, but I don't say fake. You have a generated image of a patient, so you can look into their ears. You can look, you can scope. Different things like that, is that possible? It's, it's, sure, that's possible, um, but there's that tactile aspect that you're, that you're talking about. And I think that's where mixed reality may be a benefit of moving forward. We're really interested in biometrics. Um, and so one thing that we've been talking a lot about is within the heads-up display of the HMD, 
actually having your own biometrics. What is your pulse? What is your breathing rate? What is your temperature? Right. Um, for kind of self-regulation. This is a scenario where, for example, if you were to, to have a head-mounted display with pass-through, you're looking at your, your dummy, you're doing compressions, and then you have the numbers on the screen. How fast are your compressions? How deep are you going? How well are you oxygenating? So it's that mix where those two come together and you can really make some bigger impact. Wonderful, thank you. Thanks. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, one of your early slides was uh, your literature review and the main themes, and it looked like it was mostly or all patient education and family education. My own interest is physician, uh, medical student, and, and APP education. Wait, did you find anything prospective randomized studies, or is there very little available? There's a lot out there. Yeah, there, there, there's a lot out there on and medical education. Frankly, for our scope and review, we were throwing that stuff out. Um, but when we did come across it, um, it was there. It's very preliminary. Um, I think it's clear that students are excited about it. Um, when we look at these interventions, my concern is even if we start seeing improved excitement and efficacy of the educational interventions, what happens in five to ten years when XR technologies are commonplace? Is it really making a difference, or are the benefits that we're seeing simply from the novelty of the solution? So I think we, we need to keep looking. I'll give a good example of that. When we went into schools to, and we bring headsets, kids were so excited. Most of them had never been in VR, and that may have, may have been a big play for why they finished, why they played, why they paid attention. Um, and I have a picture I usually use. It's a picture of a Chromebook that's just smashed to pieces because uh, every kid now had, gets a Chromebook, right, when they're at school. And this girl had come into the library and taken her, and she was, she's like, ah, oh. she was like, I failed this test, she was mad, and she just destroyed the Chromebook. Kids hate Chromebooks now. Like they don't, you know, they were so excited when they had them, it was this thing, and now with everyone, get out your Chromebook, and there's like eye rolling, and you know, so will we get to that place where VR has just lost its novelty, and kids aren't as excited to get in, maybe they want to get out and do something different, so. Um, I, I, we'll see it. We'll see it over the next few years. But I'm sorry. I did have a, a quick question. Um, awesome presentation. My question was about your debugged application. Was the feedback from that application for the staff a formative or summative assessment? And did you further look at the CLAPSI rates, or do you plan to for the new needle ICU? Yeah, so actually that's what we're, we're currently, like the first step in this. We just, just received funding for this project, just getting it underway. The formative work is the, the main focus. And I'll, I'll say oftentimes the formative work, we spend more time there than we do in development. So we have focus groups planned with uh, parents, with nurses, with staff. Um, and we are really trying to be thoughtful about um, DEI and how we're going to look at this because uh, culture could play a big part of why parents don't wash their hands. So we have to really, we really think about that. And also, we we don't want to translate this to Spanish right after we develop it, and because that's ridiculous. We need to be thoughtful about creating one that is for Spanish-speaking families, since even the word Spanish can be so many different populations so so yeah so being really thoughtful about that early on and that that's the process that we're in right now so but but to the point clab c rates are the ultimate outcome measure we're looking five ten years down the line uh, but that's ultimately what we want to see All right, so again, thank you for a wonderful presentation. We can give them another round of applause. <laughs> great. We are doing great on time, right on time. So I'd like to introduce our second plenary speaker, who's going to be presenting on a guide to investing, integrating, and implementing XR to simulation programs. I'd like to welcome Dr. Danielle Salgetto, who is a general intern medicine physician with a deep passion for health profession education and technology. He has extensive international teaching experience in Asia, Europe, Australia, and the American continent. Dan, uh, Dr. Selgetto is the director of simulation and education technology at Case Western Reserve University School of Medicine, where he oversees the Mount Sinai Clinical Skills and Simulation Center. And he's also responsible for developing and implementing new technologies for health professions education. Please welcome Dr. Selgetto.
Sorry, just a moment. Does everything technology always something goes wrong when you're ready to present? So just give me one second here and I'll be with you. Okay. There we go. I think we need to turn this one off. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, first of all, uh, good day and thank you so much for having me. It's a huge honor to be here. Uh, I, I'm very excited. I haven't been to New York like in 15 years, so, so this is kind of like, wow. So, so very excited to, to be here. And uh, today, oh, I left my, my clicker over here. So today, uh, actually, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Uh, usually, we, we talk about success, right? And we show the great things that we're doing. But today, uh, what I'm here to share today comes out of failure. And I'll, I'll start off probably just with a short story. About seven years back, I was very excited. I, I first discovered VR. And I was teaching clinical skills. And, and you know, I had this problem. My students didn't really know the anatomy when they were coming in, so, so it was always difficult to teach. So I said, hey, why not let's get some headsets and let's get them to review the anatomy before the class so I can teach them. And of course, everybody said no, and I had to go, and I, 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 I had to follow the chase the dean around. and all. Finally, they gave me a bit of budget. I got my headsets, got my software, and bam, it was magic. All the students were on it. Everybody was using VR, and I was so excited. And I was like, yeah, this is exactly what we needed. Four weeks later, suddenly the students were not so excited anymore. And two months later, I had a stack of boxes, 16 boxes <laughs> full of headsets, in my office to remind me of my failure. So. I really got curious, like, why did this happen? You know, it was such a good idea. They loved it. Everybody said it was great. It was fun. Why did I fail? And that is a little bit why I, I want to talk to you about these topics today. So, so hopefully, we'll, we'll get some here. You'll probably end up with more questions and answers, but th that's the purpose. That's the purpose. OK, so today we're talking, uh, so just very quickly, I'm not, uh, I have no conflict of interest with this. And the views I'm presenting are my own and not those of my institution. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about some different aspects of developing a program using extended reality. And we're going to be looking at some of the challenges that we face when we try to implement this technology in especially health professions education settings. Um, the, the biggest question, I think this is something that the previous speakers mentioned, is, you know, should we use XR or not? Right? Do we really want to use this technology? Uh, and it makes sense for us to look at this, because if we look at what's happening in healthcare technology, well, we're seeing these emerging technologies coming in with healthcare 4.0, right, in which we see robotics and Internet of Things and big data. And extended reality is one of these technologies that is expected to permeate into the provision of clinical services. So it makes sense, right? If we're going to use techno this technology in practice, it makes sense to use it in training. So. No, definitely, there's, there's a lot of very important reasons why we would think about using XR. Uh, and, but it's very important that we need to understand what it does, because XR is just a tool. And it's a tool that is not different from a whiteboard or a projector. Right? When used properly, it can be very effective. But when not used properly, it can lead to boxes stacking up in your office. So uh, the first thing we need to think about whenever we say, oh, I want to use XR for something, is you know, we need to ask ourselves three big questions. Is why are we going to do this? Well, what is the purpose? Well, what, what's the reason for this? We need to ask ourselves, who is going to be using this? Right? Who is the intended user? And then finally is the how. How are we going to use this technology as we're working through? So uh, you know, there are many whys. Uh, I think many of us have faced different reasons, for example. One is your dean comes and tells you, oh, well, you know, I was in this meeting and everybody seems to be using this technology and I think we should get started, <laughs> right? It happens, right? Yeah. Uh, or it could be sometimes it's faculty driven. You have a champion among your faculty, the, the VR champion or the XR champion, right? And they really push things along to get, make this happen. Or sometimes it's out of a problem. For example, at Case Western Reserve, we, we have a 
uh, a ridiculous number. It's like 250 HoloLens headsets, right? And why do we have this? Well, because during the COVID pandemic, they wanted the students to keep learning. And, you know, it made sense to give people a headset to go home and then they could join the classes from home. Of course, now, now we're looking at replacing those headsets and, and suddenly it's like it's three quarters of a million dollars just in, in, in headsets. It's, it's not that attractive anymore. But just to kind of give you an idea, we, so there are different reasons why we would engage in this. Um, the biggest and most important thing to understand is if you can do it on a 2D screen, don't waste your time and money doing an XR. If you're going to use XR, there has to be a purpose, a reason that XR is going to do something that you cannot get with other technology. So again, it's having a proper justification of you know, why are we going to do this. Uh, the other question is the, the who. And, and this is where, where things get a bit complicated because we need to think one is about the types of users. So for example, obviously a learner and a professional user have very different needs. Right, and might be attracted to very different things. The other thing is the user, con the user content experience. So for example, if we think about training a nurse on how to put an IV using VR, and she's put IVs on real patients for 10 years, she's probably not gonna get much from there, right? On the other hand, if it's a person who has never done it before, being able to understand what the steps of that procedure are could be very valuable. So we need to consider a little bit, who are we targeting with this? Uh, the other thing is familiarity with the actual technology, right? So for example, people who are familiar with extended reality, they, they put in a headset and they immediately start learning, right? Or sometimes what happens very frequently with our faculty is you give them the headset, they'll go like, okay, thank you. That was not, right? They know it, they're not familiar with the technology and that causes problems. If they're not comfortable with the tech, they're not going to use it. Right, so these are important things to consider, right? Or, or prior experiences, and this, this is one that, that I, I, I constantly go have with my, with my vice dean of education, is she had cyber sickness. About five years ago, she tried something, she put it on, and then she, she had to run to the bathroom to um, evacuate her, her, uh, her gastric chamber. But I mean, the, the question was, look, so every time I tell her about, oh, you know, we could do this in VR, no. No VR, uh, th that makes people sick, right? So a lot of it is you need to, you know, sometimes break some of these stereotypes like uh, cyber sickness, yes, it's a problem, but you know, if it was proper app design, with newer headsets, with better refresh rates, we know we can mitigate a lot of those. And eventually, if you use it long enough, you kind of get your VR legs, right? And then you're not that dizzy anymore. So these are things that we need to consider when you're looking at who's gonna be using the program. Uh, this is a really interesting chart, and then I kind of modified it a little bit. So this is the educational Gardner hype cycle. So what happens, and this is, explains a lot of what happened to me with that first experience, is at the beginning, people go crazy with the tech, right? You start, and everybody wants to use the technology. At Case Western, we use uh, Holo, HoloLens with, uh, for Holo Anatomy program. And what happens is the first month you walk around campus, everybody has a headset on, and everybody's interacting with some form of hologram. And you walk in there and you say, oh my God, this is just incredible, right? But then as the semester starts moving along, it gets less and less and less until about three days before the test and then the headsets are all back, right? So, <laughs> so these things happen. So how do we go from there? So we, we have this peak that, okay, this is the, the innovation, the cool thing, right? Then people get bored of it when the innovation factor goes away. So how can we rescue the situation? And, and that's where, where this comes in. Your, your educational plan is what's going to lead it from that drop of interest to a functional level. And that's what we're looking for. So the quality of your, of your educational plan and integration plan is essential to make this work. It's the scaffolding to, to get it to a, to a workable level. Right? And once you reach that level, then people become accustomed to the technology and it becomes part of your everyday. Uh, let's think a little bit about you know, technology. So for example, like your phone. How many steps does it take to get your phone to, to do what you want? One is you look at it, right? you unlock it, you press the app, and suddenly you're ready to go. Three steps. And that probably explains why most of us have this today. Right? It's very easy to use. Uh, probably watches. Watches are probably one of the most common technologies in the world. right? How do you use a watch? Well, you just do it like this, and you're ready. right? <laughs> So, so again, it's, it's a very easy to use. Now, I ask you to think, how many steps does it take for you to start using extended reality? Right? 
it's not something you just pull off and put on and you're ready to go. It, it takes a lot of step. You have to go to the special room, turn on the computer, connect the headset, or so it, it's really challenging, right? For, and so learners are not willing to consider this as their everyday technology just because there's so much work to get it done, to get it to get it to work. So again, we need to think about these different things. Other, other, other things that we might think about is where am I going to use this? Is this going to be used in a specific location? Uh, am I going to be able to use this anywhere in, 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 the, in the university? Are they going to take it home? Uh, the equipment type, how is the tracking of the headset going to work? Or do I need to plug it into a computer? Or can I just use it by itself? Right? Uh, we think about budget, and this is very, very important because we have, you know, we have the bolus budget, which suddenly you got a grant and let's invest this. And, but the problem is one, after a few years, you need to start replacing those headsets. You need to start, and where is that money going to come from? So all that effort suddenly starts fading away. So, or are we looking for something more of a continuous infusion of resources that, that maybe your leadership will be able to provide to keep going, to keep your programs going? And then finally, uh, we, regarding the apps, like are they going to be used in a single class? Or are they going to be apps that we can reuse for many different situations? So all of these things are going to have an impact on how this is accepted into your community. Um, so how do we actually put this inside the curriculum? Because that's the other one, the other thing, right? It's not a magic. It's not the Harry Potter hat that you put it on and suddenly Right? This requires you know, some effort in thinking of to how it's going to work with the rest of your teaching. So, sorry. so then we need to think about one is educational outcomes. So what, what, what are we hoping to achieve? What will people walk away with after wearing the headset? Uh, we have to think about some educational frameworks that will support that learning experience. Learning is not magic. We know that there's a science behind it, or at least we hope there is. Uh, we talk about uh, how are we going to actually use the headset, right? What is the plan? How are we going to make people work with it? And then finally, how are we going to measure those outcomes? So uh, when we think about the role of extended reality, well, you know, we have to think about what we want people to learn. So for example, if what we want is just cognitive learning, theory, we, we should give them a book, not a headset, right? Or a computer screen. or um, if what we want them is just to do psychomotor work, well, maybe a task trainer is more suitable, right? Or if what we want them is to learn effective skills, working with a simulated patient might be much more effective. So the, the interesting thing with extended reality is that it fills gaps in which we need combinations of skills to happen. And, and that is where uh, extended reality really has a very interesting offer in terms of education. Uh, you know, what, what specific outcomes can we expect? So what, what, what really can we get from the, from the technology? Well, we need to think a little bit about what educational theories are going to support this learning. Like, for example, we think about the experiential learning cycle. Well, one is we could use it in, a, in the concrete experience part. So we can offer them an experience, and then they take it off, and then we talk about it, go through the rest of it. Or maybe the, the app gives them feedback. So we are also doing experience and reflection, right? Uh, so we need to think about where the technology is going to fit within this cycle that we're already used to in simulation. Uh, other important thing is, is where, what kind of learner is the technology going to work best for, right? And we know that in this kind of basic to advanced skill development, it's highly effective. Learning the steps of a procedure, learning you know, what equipment you're going to be using, uh, learning what things you need to be careful about. But on the other hand, if you're working with more experienced users, it's harder to, to provide something. And we all know that every time you work with an advanced student, it's harder to teach them because what they need to learn is much more specific. Uh, other important thing is, is about the motivation to learn, right? And this is where we need to find the right challenge in the technology so that our students will learn. So for example, if it's too difficult, then it becomes really frustrating, people give up. If it's too easy, people get bored. So it's all about finding that, that spot. But this is all skill dependent, right? A high skilled person will have a different needs than a low skilled person. So having apps that are able to adjust to the needs of the learner are, is very important if we want to provide for a wider audience. 
Um, other important things we need to consider are, are the cognitive load part of it. And this is where, for example, we think about the germane cognitive load, the, the, the experience that we already have in learning. So being familiar with XR really helps, right? The first day you give students headsets and they put it on, is probably not the best day for them to learn something, right? We, for example, I, I usually like to get my students to play with something before they actually start learning. Uh, also, being familiar with the content is, is also something that can help, right? If they already more or less understand the content, it's easier for them to learn in, in, an, in, a, in an extended reality than if they're completely unfamiliar with it. But then we have things that are proper from, from the intrinsic load. So, and this has to do with the difficulty of the content, and it has to do with the amount of guidance that is provided to the user during the experience. Or we have the extrinsic content load, and this is when we have for example, apps that are not well designed, you know, if there are errors in the user interface, people get fed up with it very quickly. Or if there are hardware issues, like for example, low frame rate on the headset in which you, know, you start getting really dizzy and, and all these things. So we need to balance all these factors in order to create the optimal learning environment for our students or for, for whoever is using the device. So it's all about balancing. Uh, again, with, uh, if we're looking at procedural trainer, the, the Peyton's uh, framework is, is quite useful. And we can see how uh, you know, extended reality and VR are very effective in these first three steps. Like for example, being able to observe a procedure, being able to comprehend the steps involved in that procedure and the equipment involved in those steps. And then finally, being able to, to really kind of understand you know, what I need to do step by step when, I, when I'm going to do it. But then, the fourth is where things fall a little bit flat, especially with VR, because we don't have the ability to provide that psychomotor experience at this moment. We might in the future, but at this point, honestly, it's not there. It's just not, I know they're haptic gloves and all that, but it's not, you know, the, the, the fine level of sensory feedback needed to train in the procedure is not there yet. On the other hand, with AR, we can, you know, we can combine it with a task trainer. And it becomes a really effective learning tool. And, and I, I know you guys in, in Michigan are doing some wonderful stuff with that. So again, the combination of, with, with other types of learning devices, it can be very effective. Uh, this is just a, 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 a publication we, we had recently about some of these frameworks. And, and if you're interested in this topic, we, we invite you to give it a read. Uh, it discusses more in detail about these frameworks and, and what they can do for us when planning extended reality. Okay, so um, how will we use VR? And this is the other big question, right? How are we planning to use it? Because sometimes we forget to visualize, you know, where is this learning going to happen and how it's gonna happen? Well, there's several models that we can look at. One is the self-directed model. So your student puts on the headset and learns by himself. You might have a, a team model with, with a faculty member and the student or a peer and the student working together to learn from the environment. We might go for a different model in which there's an observational model, right? We have a screen displaying the view from the headset and then one person is immersed and then we, we can observe and give feedback or commentary. Or we could have a team of people in VR interacting with each other and with the digital environment. So there are many ways in which we can actually make use of this. We could also have a single person with a team outside. So we need to think about what modality are, are, are we, am I gonna use to interact with my headset. We might not even stick to one. We might have a combination of modalities in order for, for our students to learn more comfortably. Uh, everybody learns differently, right? So having a variety of ways in which you can use the technology is gonna really give access to more learners. Uh, the other important thing is assessment. And we know assessment drives education. We've said that forever, right? And that's what simulation is all about, right? But with XR or VR, it's the, same, it's the same situation, right? And this, maybe I'll, I'll just refer to, they were mentioning the student, you know, we can't see what the students are actually looking at, right? And that's terrible because we don't know if they're really doing what they were supposed to do. So again, having some type of assessment, some form of measurement of their outcome is essential for us to, to understand if the technology is being used properly or not. When we look at assessment, there are several forms. We could use intrinsic assessment, data from the hardware and the software to indicate performance, right? And this is when you get the metrics and, and time and all these other things. We could have an extrinsic type of assessment 
a, feed, a person who is observing the student and providing feedback on what they're doing. Or we could even have a combination of both. And usually, I mean, I think the combination usually tends to be a, a preferred model because we get kind of both sides of it. Sometimes when people just get the data from the app, they don't take it too seriously. Like, oh yeah, I got four stars. And then... <laughs> the other important thing is how is this experience gonna work within the curriculum, right? And this is where things get very tricky because I see a lot of this happening. We have the one class that uses extended reality. And the students have to learn how to use all the equipment, right? And they, they learn how to use the, they become familiar with it, they do the class, and then they never touch a headset again, right? And all that learning is just wasted. So we need to look at using the technology in more than one place. So for example, we can look at a horizontal integration model, several classes simultaneously, that are using headsets in different capacities. We could have a vertical model, and this is what we're doing in Case Western with our anatomy program. So anatomy right now is the only program using the technology, but it goes throughout the continuum of, of the education. So they're using the headset for the same class during their training. Or we could have a, a, a combined integration, in which headsets are integrated in different parts of the curriculum, and students are able to transfer that skill, that knowledge of, of the technology to another class. And this is ideal because then what happens is it becomes a much better investment, right? Because here, where we're spending all this money for one time, whether here it makes sense to spend in the technology because we can use it many times. We know it's cost effective. Um, investing in XR is, is a challenge. It's, it's a big question, like, you know, what should I buy? There's so much stuff out there. What software do I need? Well, there are a couple of important things that we do need to consider. One is what are your current and future needs, right? Because we always have to think ahead, like what are we gonna be doing next year? Uh, hardware, software, and the space. So those are kind of like the four big th things that we need to start asking ourselves in terms of financing. Uh, when we talk about hardware features, it's really important to understand a couple of key features. You don't have to be a, a hardware whiz to buy the technology, but you do need to know is it, if it's gonna be tethered or untethered, so do you need to buy a computer or not? That makes a huge impact on the cost because a computer that runs VR is gonna cost you 2,000 bucks extra, right? So if you look at headset plus computer, that, that's quite a bit of money. Uh, on the other hand, for example, screen resolution is important, right? We know that people get fatigued, especially if you had that, the older headsets, right, that you got, used to get tired after half an hour, you're like walking blind. Uh, we have uh, high refresh rates, and again, uh, the refresh rates are very, very closely connected to uh, cyber sickness in many people. And then finally, the cost of the, of the equipment itself. Like, if you buy very expensive headsets that need to replaced, be replaced three years later, then you're in a bit of trouble, right? Because suddenly, like for us, we're, we're suddenly looking at having to find three quarters of a million dollars that we want to replace all our headsets, which is, is very difficult, right? It's not easy, at least I don't know. Well, in my institution, they don't, they don't throw money like that. So the same everywhere, right? Yeah, so, so it's, we need to think about this because many times we get so excited and vendors love to tell you, oh yeah, this is the best headset in the market. It's got like 8K resolution and you're like so excited. And then you paid $5,000 for something you need to replace two years down the road. So important to think about the longer term. Uh, same thing with the software. So you know, what is this software going to do? Is it only for one thing or can I be using it for more things? Uh, is it a subscription that I pay every month or do I have to like pay a large amount of money for a piece of software that is never going to be updated again, right? Uh, the other thing we need to think about whether, you know, is it a fixed difficulty in the software or can I change the difficulty according to, to our learner's level? This allows me to apply it to a much larger population. Uh, we can see if there's feedback or metrics. We can look at you know, whether we want to buy software or we want to make our own. Like for example, I know some of you have incredible projects that you're developing, but it's not easy to do that. You need to have a large team and very good funding in order to successfully produce VR, right? Whether purchasing a software, if you're gonna start up, might be a better avenue, right? There's less investment and Again, instead of having a team of 20 people focusing on developing one app, which is, you know, is very difficult, um, you can have a smaller team that is just managing existing apps and you can actually work together with the developers 
you can partner with them to tell them, oh, I'd like to see these features in future versions. And, and they, many of them are very happy to do that. They, they like the feedback. And then finally, uh, the licensing model is really important to consider as well. Individual licensing, they charge you per student. And, and this can be a real pain sometimes because maybe the student just uses it two months in a year and you, you have to pay a yearly subscription for it. Or institutional license, which gives you a nice little package that you can use. So this is kind of, I think, is a bit more suitable for, for educational settings. Um, and then finally, when developing a program, there, there are you know, the factors that you need to think about, right? So you need to think about what hardware, users and faculty, software, and the educational program that you're going to be integrating to. And this is where, for example, if you're doing educational programs, then we need to think about, okay, maybe we should think of this not as a standalone session, but we should be in integrated, right? We should measure outcomes. We should understand how people are learning from the technology. On the other hand, from a hardware point of view, we, we, you know, it's better to start small, right? Because one thing that sometimes people don't think about is the amount of effort to manage devices. Uh, for example, at Case Western, we have an army of people that every time there's an update to the HoloLens 2, it's a nightmare. It's complete chaos. People running around with headsets is, is not a pretty sight. Um, other important things that we can think about, for example, is inside-out tracking is lovely because you can use it in any room, so you're not limited to one room. Uh, 360 cameras uh, actually are an interesting way to get started into, into app development. It's the easiest way. You do a little, couple of 360 videos or, or, or still pictures and you walk the students. We did a really interesting project with just a $500 camera. We went to the OR and we took 360 pictures of all the OR. We put it together in an app and our students would go to the OR before their first day. They would virtually go to there. So they came in, they already know, I don't touch this, I, I, this I can touch, I, I have to leave my, my, my clothes here, my lockers over there. So the nurses loved it, right? The OR nurses loved it because nothing worse than, than the first day the students are on rotation and they're doing all kinds of weird stuff. So this was very effective and it was very cheap. It costed like maybe $1,000 in total to develop it, right? And then finally, uh, consider software and hardware compatibility. This is really important because sometimes you buy your, your hardware and then you change to, you update your hardware a little bit and then the app is no longer compatible with the new version and then it's another nightmare and your investment is poof, gone in the air. Uh, regarding software, again, starting with, with existing apps is always an advantage, right? Um, again, uh, if you're doing 360 platforms today are so easy to do, it's like a PowerPoint and you just drop stuff on top and suddenly you created your VR app. Um, and this is another area, and today we're going to have a session discussing this in more detail, but partnering up. You no, know, XR doesn't have to be a lonely road. Actually, you would be surprised of the amount of duplication that we encounter, right? Everybody's doing their thing, and then you realize, oh, I did this, oh, I did that too, right? And then suddenly you're, you're in this position that, you know, all this effort was, was kind of really lost. You had to reinvent the wheel at each place. So, I think working together, creating consortiums or groups, and I hope this, this is something we can consider after, after this, this session is, you know, can we work together at least exchanging ideas and being able to brainstorm and think, okay, well, maybe you, you have one experience, I have a different one, maybe we can find a way to make it work better. Okay, and then finally, again, prioritizing apps that are multi-purpose, right? We, we can use in more than one setting. Uh, Okay, and then finally, and this is a really important thing because it's important to, to really kind of promote the use with your faculty and your learners. And, and I do highlight the word faculty, right? Because it's so important for the faculty to understand the technology that their students are using. Uh, a couple of things that, that we like to do for that is one, is we do pre-training sessions. So people learn how to use the hardware and software before they walk into the classroom because there's nothing worse than, than walking in and, and you have no idea how to use it and you're supposed to tell them how to use it and it, it's just chaos. Uh, other things, for example, uh, offer opportunities for casual use. Yeah, and sometimes I have like play dates, right? I like to do play days and, and sometimes, you know, people come in, you have some games in there, they've got some really cool like pirate games and shooters and stuff that you can, you can use. But people are actually learning they're not learning medical content, but they're learning how to use the equipment so that later when it's time to learn, they're, they're, they know what to do. Uh, other important thing is teaching your faculty how to troubleshoot the equipment, and that's another important element, right? 
helping our faculty understand, okay, look, if, the, if people can't use or are having trouble, what can you do? Uh, I, we had a very interesting uh, issue with, with students that said that the VR headsets were blurry. And everybody was stumped, oh, blurry, and, and they sent one to the technician, and they came back and said, no, it's perfectly okay. Well, it ended up that the students were not putting it correctly on their face. It was a little bit tilted, so it looked blurry because it was tilted, not because there was something wrong with the equipment. Something that could have been solved in two seconds took three months while it went back to the vendor and all that. So again, teaching how to troubleshoot, basic troubleshooting, important. So finally, just to, to maybe bring things together, like where are we going? Like what, what, what is the future for this? And, and what, why, well, how will XR continue to permeate into our curriculums? Well, no, there's several things to consider. Uh, one is evidence. We still know that it's lacking severely. And for example, uh, we need more research. This is a paper that we published some time ago. And I put this here, not, not to show off the paper, but I put this here just to tell you about the pain to get this published. Everybody rejected it. Why? Because they had no reviewers. Like, oh, do you know any reviewers that could review your paper? I'm like, well, okay, but that kind of defeats the purpose, right? <laughs> I, I can tell my uncle to help me out. No, but, but it's true. Like, it was so difficult to publish this because nobody could review it, right? And it was, it was I mean, it's, I, I'm not saying it's the best paper, but it was not bad, right? And, but yet it kept getting rejected by everybody. Just in case, medical teachers starting a new section called Innovations that is aiming to capture all of these cool things that we're doing, uh, well, they'll probably be sending out some information later. Talk about commercial interest, right? No, no, I have no stake in medical teacher. Uh, other important thing is improved haptics. So yes, haptics are out there. They're still not good enough for what we want them, but they will be someday. You know, imagine the day in which you can see, hear, and feel right, then you're, you're there, right? That, that's what immersion is about. And so once we reach that level in the technology, like, do we really need so many task trainers? Well, maybe we can get away with a few less, right? Oh. Uh, other important things are the new developments. For example, we know that we can get heat maps, visual heat maps. We can see what our students are looking at and, and process that data and analyze it. Imagine how important, if you had a clinical reasoning scenario, and you can know what were your students looking at when they make their decisions, right? Did they notice the splinter hemorrhages in their fingernails, right? So, so the, no, the amount of data we can get from, from this is incredible. We've never had access to that before. Or uh, things such as, for example, uh, lip reading or mouth reading or facial expression tracking, right? Imagine what that would do for interacting with an avatar. Because right now, you know, the, the, the VR avatars are all like, how are you today? I am fine. Right? So, so it's, it's not that attractive. No, it, it's, it's unimmersive, right? You feel, okay, yeah, this is, this is. But again, if you could create more realistic avatars based on, on expression, then it could be more, very exciting. Uh, hand recognition and, and you know, being able to track the motion of your hands. I, I don't know about you guys, but I hate holding those wands after a while and your hands, your palms start sweating and the things are slipping off. And, so again, if, if we can interact more naturally with the world, it's easier for us to understand it and to feel comfortable with it. Um, adaptive content, so you know, can we adjust difficulty of our content according to our learner's needs? Uh, and is this gonna run? And then the use of VR for other professional settings, like, you know, because we want them to, to understand why it's important. Like for example, this is an app that you upload DICOMs so your CT images or MRIs, you upload them and you can just play around with them and make them bigger, smaller, cut them in any direction you want. And it gives you a better understanding of what's going on. We were using this with anesthesia to evaluate airways of patients with a history of difficult airways. So again, if we start finding clinical applications for it, then it makes a lot more sense to have it for our learners. Okay, so basically that's uh, what the story I was here to tell you. Uh, I hope some of this was useful, and uh, again, I know that sometimes we end up with more questions than what we, we started, but please feel free to reach out. I'm all about collaborating. I, 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 I really hope to get in touch with people and to start kind of really working together to make this technology work. Because sometimes it's scary, but we see what, for example, like Meta has not been very successful with their, with their metaverse, right? And the reason is everybody's kind of working separately, right? But if we can manage to come together to, to share ideas, to share experiences, to start thinking about what the best practices look like, 
then we can really make a change and introduce a technology that is going to revolutionize the way our learners are thinking and learning. Thank you. I'm going to stand a little bit far away because if not, we're going to get interference oh, from the okay. mics. No, no. Oh, actually, is it even on? I think I shut it down. Sorry. That's okay. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. That was amazing. That was excellent. You answered a lot of my questions <laughs> with that presentation. So now it's time for question and answer. So if you have any questions for Dr. Selgetto, please come to one of the microphones. Was this, is this on? Can everyone hear me? Yes. That was an amazing presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, question around funding, uh, especially when we're talking about uh, starting small and then getting uh, larger. Uh, how does your school uh, tackle funding? Are you, do you centrally fund it? Do you looking at corporate partnerships? What are some of the different funding models that uh, your school is thinking about or are doing now? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. So um, the, the main funding model in case that, that propelled the, the AR was through a collaboration with Microsoft. So there was uh, publicity involved and, and excitement and, and, and being the, the, the tech school. So then they were very willing to put funding into it. Um, so that, that has been the main funding model. The problem is that was for one project. That was for the whole anatomy project that, that they created. But then if you want to do something there, something outside of that, then there's, there are no funds available. So that's when we start getting into trouble that we need to look for grants or something to get, to get us started, but then we know that grants can start you off, but they're not going to maintain your project. So that's why also it's important, and I think it's really important to educate the leadership about the, the importance of that sustainability, because so far, and I think most of the leadership sees XR as a show-off opportunity, right? Oh, we're the XR university. But I think it's, it's all about getting them to understand how important it is to really think about the future with this and knowing that these headsets do not last forever and that they need to be replaced, that the technology will change, and that we need to adjust to that. So that's a really good point. And thank you for sharing that. Thank you very much uh, for your candid statements and presentation. It was refreshing to see so many different perspectives. And I especially appreciated you bringing attention to the cognitive learning theories and mentioning Vygotsky. Um, I personally find it challenging to, as you mentioned, be able to make a proposal for XRs, for XR education, especially since it is so expensive and it does require that kind of sustainable um, budgetary line, if you will. And we tend to think that it should be connected to advanced education, which is probably its hardest approach to implement. And so my question to you is thinking about the cognitive learning theories and how this isolates students in areas where they gain the most from this type of technology, where at least to me and, and from my knowledge, it's not being used in collaborative education as much as it is to single out independent learning at lower years of study or you know freshman, sophomore years of study. How have you come across any way to overcome that barrier where that social interaction that is proven in the evidence as being beneficial, particularly in the healthcare professions, can be overcome by where this extended type of reality is actually applied? That's, that's a very, very good question. And unfortunately, I don't have a great answer for it. Um, so we've tried different things. For example, one idea was, OK, with AR, we can see each other. Right? And so then technically we can interact. But I don't know if you've ever tried to interact with somebody who's wearing a headset while you're wearing a headset. It, it feels pretty ridiculous, yes. right? To the yes. point that when you say, hey, just take it off, let's talk. Yep. Right? Exactly. So, so that, that is one factor that, that is a problem. Uh, the other thing is in VR, again, is uh, I, I think the avatars are not yet at that point in which you feel very comfortable interacting with an avatar. But I think it's a matter of just evolving the technology and getting used to it. Like, for example, to be honest with you, I hated Zoom before the pandemic. Like, I, I, just, I just could not stand to one look at my ugly face there, plus all the other people in the meeting. It was just, it was just annoying to me. But now it's just second nature. 
So I think as the technology evolves and the avatar technology improves, we're going to be more comfortable with that and those interactions might happen uh, in a better way. And then the other thing is, uh, if we think about this in terms of cognitive load, by once we get familiar with, the, with, those, with those virtual environments, with you know, wearing a headset, when, then it, it's a lot easier to interact. Um, I don't, I don't know if anybody has ever played any, any games in VR. I, mm -hmm. You know, the, the first 10 minutes, you, you know, you're really wearing the headset <laughs> and it's uncomfortable. But after a while, you, you forget the headset is there, right? Until you, you, you hit the wall and then, yo, yeah, <laughs> it's VR. But, uh, but I think usage, regular usage, is essential for the technology to become more accessible and less cumbersome for, for the learner. So, Thank you. Sure. I think that's the main challenge is how do we apply it and justify it at the same time with sustainable competencies achieved as our outcomes. It's, it's very challenging. Thank you. Thanks for bringing that up. That's great. Thank you so much. Wonderful talk. And, and I really appreciate your sharing your experience with us today, um, including your stumbling blocks. And I wanted to go back to the uh, experience you first had in an anatomy you described. And then at, towards the end of the talk, you showed that you had some uh, vertical um, you know, integration there. So I'm curious what changed now and are, are the boxes still stacked in your office or, or, or what did you sort of discover to lead towards the next success? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. I, I, I'm very sorry to say that the solution was changing institutions. Um, so yeah, so the, 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 the first experience happened in Japan. I was, I was living uh -huh. in Japan and working there and, uh, and yeah, unfortunately I, those headsets are probably still stacked in that office for whoever took it over. Um, I think it's really important to, to start properly, like to, to really get the leadership on board before you actually start doing anything. Because what happens is if they're looking at this like just a side project and they're just throwing a bit of money at you to, to kind of get something going, they're never really going to take it seriously. And, and that's where things start failing. So I'm um, hearing that there's a lot more buy-in at your new institution. Can you describe that a little bit more, what that looks like? Sure. So, so basically, the, the, the interest uh, started off with a collaboration with industry. So uh, Case Western Reserve has a very big collaboration with Microsoft. They created a, a center called the Interactive Commons, which is dedicated to producing to, to studying new technology and, and to see how it can be uh, integrated. And that's where this whole anatomy program from CASE got started. Uh, so that was the, the big buy-in uh, because, you know, for, uni for a university, being partnered with, with a well-known uh, company or institution is something attractive, right? That, that's going to make people feel that, you know, this is, this is it. And actually, for example, when, when the students come in for admissions and stuff, you know, they show them all, all the headsets and they put it on, they try it. Because, you know, it's something that they feel attracted to, even if it's just kind of an initial innovation trend. But um, it's difficult. It's difficult to, to find that balance and, and to find people to work with. And you need to be really careful. Uh, and this is a, something we were discussing yesterday at dinner is many times companies are expecting you to, to provide all your secrets for free, right? And they come and they say, oh, can you give us some feedback? And, and it's, really, it's a really difficult position, right? So sometimes I think we need to find a way to, to really learn how to collaborate with industry, how to also protect our intellectual property. So we need to have some know-how about that. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that's really important going into any commercial relationship. Thank you. Sure, thank you for the question. Morning. Thank you for your presentation. My name is Ismira. I'm a registered nurse, and my passions are around spiritual care education for undergraduate nursing students. And I understand using VR to teach skills hands-on. What are your views on teaching through VR soft skills such as spiritual care provision? Yeah, that's a really good question, and I think a lot has to do with with the quality of the avatars that you're going to be interacting with. Uh, Honestly, when it comes to, to pure people skills, the best way to learn is with people. And, and uh, I, I'm, I love working with, with uh, simulated participants, for example, because I think they have so much to offer. And I don't think uh, at this point there's any software that can replicate that, that sense of talking to a real human being. Um, so I, I think that that's a, a challenging area, and that's probably going to be the the ultimate goal of virtual reality is to create avatars that are realistic enough to fool you into thinking it's a person. Uh, there are some very interesting initiatives actually with that. Uh, 
uh, I saw this project that in which they would interact in a virtual environment, but the avatar was actually another another player in, in, in the simulation. And, and that, that can give you a lot more realism and all that. So maybe that could be an interesting way to do it. But again, if you're going to do it with a real person in, in VR, well, why not meet face to face? So it is challenging. And I think the technology has still a long way to go before we, we feel comfortable in, in, in really interacting directly with, with an avatar and, and, and getting responses that are realistic. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for a very stimulating and cur curiously uh, intriguing uh, presentation. Thank you. Uh, my name is Priscilla. I am from Mount Sinai, and I'm director of simulation education. My background is in nursing. Uh, I have two questions. One is I'm just curious to know that uh, with the headset, is there a possibility to attach it to a monitor like the robotic surgery? Like the robotic surgery is attached to a monitor, and you can see exactly what the learners are doing. Uh, yeah, so that is something that is very frequently done. Uh, there are two ways to do it. Before, you need to connect a cable. And that was pretty cumbersome, because if you ever do VR with a cable, suddenly you're doing it, it pulls your neck off. So that, that's a bit challenging. But for example, the newer headsets that are untethered are able to stream to, to a screen. So for example, I can be wear, wearing a headset here, and I could be projecting what I'm seeing onto the screen. And, and that is a model that sometimes we use uh, so that we can, have, we can kind of be able to, to use VR with a group with less equipment, is that you have one person using it, and the other people are observing what that person is doing through the screen and giving feedback or, or I don't know, yelling encouragement or, or anything else that is necessary. Cheering. Okay, so my second question is, we did like the, uh, the uh, uh, visual presentation of educational outcomes and the outcome measurements. Again, I'm just curious, like, it, uh, are there studies already done? Maybe there are, I'm just I'm not uh, probably look at, attaching uh, XR to actual patient outcomes or clinical outcomes, so from performance to actual patient outcomes. Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And I think that's one of the very extremely challenging things because patient outcomes depend on so many factors that is really difficult to pinpoint if, if, if the VR training was really what produced that change. Probably specifically for patient safety. Mm -hmm. uh, if VR or XR are used for procedural training. So what are the, uh, the errors that were caught or... Uh, I forgot what to say, but like were caught before the, uh, the uh, performers actually uh, did. Yeah. So uh, there are several apps that look into this, applications, not studies, but just uh, an app. For example, I, we, I remember a task trainer that if you touch, once you gloved up, if you touched anything, your hands would turn red. Mm -hmm. So then you would, you would be contaminated. And, then it was, and you had to start the whole thing over again, which was pretty frustrating. But, but uh, so, so these kind of things could technically have an impact on behaviors, but it, again, it's really hard to see how that's going to translate to to clinical performance. Um, you would have to have a very specific, very particular setting that would allow you to do that. And uh, at least for, from from my side, it would, I, I don't I can't imagine um, how we could we could actually accomplish that easily. It would probably require very close work with a clinical institution and to see track outcomes for a long period of time to see if the VR really made a difference. Thank you so much. Sure, it's my pleasure. OK, thank you so much. Hello? Thank you. Hello? OK. Thank you again, Dr. Seljato. Um, so now we have time for a break. So uh, I think the breakfast and drinks are still out there. So we'll meet back in this room at 11 o'clock, and then we'll tell you about the next segment. All right. So everyone, again, meet back here at uh, 11 o'clock. No plans? <laughs> We're holding an XR summit.
Sorry about that. No, it's okay. Can I leave it here? Or? Yeah, sure. Okay. Thank you. All righty, folks. If we can all just take our seats real quickly. Describing it, I'll, just, I'll do logistics. No yeah, yeah, here. sure. Well, I could, yeah. Are you ready? Thank you, everyone. We have uh, an amazing second half. We're actually going to be breaking out into smaller groups um, and applying what we've learned. The morning sessions were great. So much information uh, that was spoken. Let's actually put that into use. Uh, my colleague, David, is going to talk a bit more about the breakout sessions. And then we're all going to turn our little name tags around and you'll see there's a sticker on the back that lets you know what uh, breakout session you're part of and then we're just going to go up the stairs uh, to our respective rooms. David? Thank you. So we're really excited to keep the conversation going and, and continue to learn from each other. So this part of the workshop, uh, as Perks said, the back of your badge will have your assigned room. There will be facilitators in each room um, to just guide the conversation. Each room will have a topic, and you'll learn more about it when you get there on one of the themes that we heard about from this morning. And we're hoping uh, we'll spend around 30 minutes or so in the rooms and then come back to the large room and hear a quick report out of a couple of key points uh, from each room so we could learn from each other. Um, that's about it. So I think we should really maximize the time together, interactive. So um, check the back of your badge. Some of you will be staying in the auditorium. The rest go up the steps to find your room. Anything yes. else? Uh, no, actually, I'll just read out the rooms. Uh, breakout session one is going to be in the auditorium. Breakout session two is going to be in room 301 uh, up the stairs. Breakout session three is room 315. And breakout session four is 316. So the folks that are staying here, uh, sit tight. And the other folks that are in other breakout rooms, please go up the stairs and we'll be in your respective rooms. Thank you.
let's see, who is group one? Do we have group one? Yes. Okay, we are all back. Oh. Hello, everyone. Thank you for making your way back. I hope that breakout session, you've got to actually apply the learnings and all the information. They were really engaging. I know our breakout session, we had great conversations, especially uh, since we were able to also have our industry partners and some of them as well. Um, and so we will start off uh, with the first breakout session readout. Who uh, was the reporter for breakout session one? Community building, do we have a reporter? Or the leader? No, the reporter, reporter. Yes. Oh, reporter, reporter. reporter. And, and he wants to read off your topic, or sure, can you? Yeah, the question. Well, okay, go ahead. to get it done so oh do I need this can you guys not hear me it's better, it's good. It's better? okay great so the buy-in is a big part of this uh, just not just buy-in that yes we think this is great you have to do it but as uh, David mentioned um, you have to figure out why is it that you're doing this why is it they want to use VR so we want to make sure that obviously this is takes place in the appropriate manner and we had written there before that's all about behavior change you know, some, some people in our group mentioned that, you know, we may have some uh, faculty who may not be as tech savvy in using this. And so, you know, we have to kind of convince them as to why this is valuable. This is not just going to enhance the experience for the students, but also may complement with the E, complement the didactic learning that's going to happen. So they have to kind of see that value. One of the things that came up from the morning also was funding, right? Where can organizations that want to start this get that funding, not just to get it a startup, but to sustain it. And that's where the administration comes in, the higher ups, as I like to say, the C-suite folks that figure out where they can sustain this project. Because if you can get it started, if you can't sustain it, now what are you going to do with that afterwards? You know, um, Big part of this, obviously, IT. We have to make sure that the IT of your organization can work with whatever company you're going to use. So I had this personal experience working at a college where everything was great, everyone's on board, IT came on board and said, well, you know, that's not compatible with the system we have. Big hiccup, right? So we want to make sure that that's also part of your process. Uh, and then talking about, you know, why are, why are you doing this? I mentioned this earlier, and you mentioned, you know, uh, someone didn't write, I wasn't sure. So it's making the learning better, cheaper, faster. What was the fourth one? No, that was cheaper. Easier, that was it. I feel like we're talking about the six million dollar man. Faster, <laughs> stronger. Oh, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, and is really the cost the biggest limit here? You know, we have to be realistic that this, this is not gonna come cheap, so we have to figure that out. Um, and then making sure, this was a key term that someone brought up. What was your name? Yeah, no, no, I know what it is. What was your name? Nancy. So when we're talking again, against, again, talking about funding, Right, the ROI. If we're going to approach administration finance to help sustain this, this is this is this is their mantra, right? They want to know exactly what's going to be their return on investment. So we have to figure out. Someone had mentioned grants, um, funding. Make sure you know who it is you're approaching for the money. Make sure you know what is their mission, what is their goal, what are those outcomes that they're going to be looking for. Are they really into research? Are they really into changing something else? So then you approach your project, propose it with those measurable outcomes there. Because otherwise, if they're interested in A, and you say we're gonna measure B, they're not gonna be interested. They're not gonna fund you. It's just that straightforward. Uh, and it's, if you do all that, try not to set yourself up for failure, because otherwise, you're not gonna be able to sustain this. So, I know that was a lot, but. Thank you. Okay, break, breakout session number two.
Good morning. Uh, my name is Vicente Navarro. Um, so we were group number two, um, and we were tasked with um, discussing, you know, how to create value in academic and healthcare settings. Um, so some of the, the things that we spoke about, right, was that the simulations need to be interactive. Um, we should try to not just replicate procedures for the sake of replicating them, but maybe there are procedures that are too dangerous or using specific equipment, right? We discussed using a, like a CT scanner um, and how we would be able to train folks in these places, right, uh, to use these pieces of equipment. Um, an example of just a, an application that was tested a number of years ago was a data visualization application in VR. So this was about six years ago. Um, it required an Oculus Rift. You connect the Oculus Rift to your computer, fire up this very expensive machine, put on a headset, and then you just got to see bar graphs in virtual reality, right? <laughs> so a waste of time. So I think this dovetails Dr. Salcedo's, right? Um, talk about we really need to make sure that these things are, you know, valid use cases. Okay, we also spoke about um, taking it beyond just healthcare simulation, right? We spoke about empathy training and sensitivity training. Um, we discussed, um, what was the name of the application of the young man? Thousand Cut Journey uh, by Dr. Courtney Cogburn. That's right, so um, that's an application which shows you what it's like to grow up, right, as a black man, you know, from essentially birth, you know, through adulthood and the difficulties in that, right? So these are some of the um, use cases that we discussed. Um, okay, um, we also discussed living with mental illness, right? Um, how we would be able to target that. Um, there was also a discussion about uh, an application on the Oculus where you can essentially experience life as a blind person. Again, you know, a lot of sensitivity and empathy training, putting yourself in someone else's um, shoes. Okay. Um, we discussed experiential learning and training, right, and measuring the outcomes. All the metrics need to be established ahead of time before, you know, we know exactly, instead of doing something just for the sake of doing it in VR, we need to be able to measure those outcomes. We need to have the metrics well established um, before we start, you know, developing these applications. There was also a mention of governance, right? As, as you're going and, and starting these and you're starting to form a group, um, Daniel made a good point of what is that government, a governance structure going to look like, right? Do you have, uh, not this in, in the higher education, not in a higher education setting, the, uh, the C-suite sort of buy-in or senior leadership buy-in, um, and this was mentioned uh, in the mornings as well, uh, and making sure that they are on board to provide leadership support and also those funding opportunities as well. Uh, but that's really important to have a, a formal structured uh, a way of doing work. Um, yes, and we also discussed, right, um, as Prax had said, you know, um, support for just continuing um, to support the staff. So we spoke about nurses and uh, nurse practitioners, continuous support, you know, through the C-suite, you know, buy-in. So that's it. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Breakout number three. Randy, good. I knew someone was going to choose you yeah. to be a, you're a natural leader. Yeah. <laughs> no, you just can't shut me up. Uh, uh, Randy Red from Yale University. Um, so I'm actually going to start at the back because um, we, we actually, the, the best stuff happened at the end. And Randy, yours is how do we leverage collaboration across the university? Right? Yes. Correct? Okay. Yes. I, I, and break down silos, that kind of idea. And it, like, like I'm, I'm, I'm the last group, right? No. There's a fourth group? fourth group? Great. I just didn't want to be standing between you guys and lunch. It's the next group that's doing that. So. <laughs> Um, but but I, actually, Olga, as we were talking, um, Olga made this comment. Um, we create our own silos, and it's sort of like you know that I reference like the old cartoon Pogo. You know, we've seen the enemy, and he is ourselves. So so one of the it's I, I mean this just rang so true. It's like you know I invite people from the other departments all the time, and they never come to my events. And it's like, well, yeah, but are you going to their events? You know, it's like, so, so really being cognizant of that, like silos starts with us. 
So, so how, how do I get out and how do I, you know, kind of walk the walk and talk the talk? Um, and, and that just seemed like such a powerful sort of way to think about it. Um, I appreciate and share experience with, with all the key stakeholders. You know, again, you know, put yourself in other people's shoes. Think about what their challenges are. What, what are their time frames? When do they, you know, different disciplines have different freedom around different parts of the day. So, so how do you find things that work for them? You know, for students, you know, Friday night at seven o'clock might be a really good time. It's not so great for the staff, you know, maybe, you know, the, you know I've, I've got, you know, doctors I work with, we have our meetings at like 7 a.m. because that's the right time for them to have free, you know, so finding the time to have the flexibility to understand what the other people need and what works with them. Um, uh, engagement is the key, step-by-step -step approaches. Um, start simple. Don't, don't try to, you know, start way up here at the super, do, do the easy stuff first and just build on the easy stuff over time and eventually you'll end up at a place where you actually do have that cross-silo um, communication. Um, from the group, that's other, other themes that I'm, I'm not getting to that you wanted to call out sort of hit it for us. All right, good, we're good. Thank you. And last but not least, number four, what are some of the burning needs or questions about XR in academic training or healthcare that you would like to see developed or investigated? What's that? Our group topic list, what are some of the burning research questions that we need to answer? Oh, I thought it was introduced. Yeah, burning research questions that we need answered. Um, we need uh, buy-in from, from administration, because if you don't have that, you can't get started for sustainability and long-term planning. We need implementation science methodology, and above all, we need for the administration to not think of it as just a fad, just another thing that's gonna start this year and end next year, uh, especially since the technology is growing at such a you know, uh, uh, it's gonna grow for a long, long time, and if you just get in and out now, you won't be able to do much with it. Um, we need effectiveness studies to demonstrate the impact of learning and clinical outcomes. We need evidence for use, uh, at, uh, for use at, at different levels of education. We need comparative effectiveness studies and other teaching modalities. And uh, we need real research opportunities. Uh, we need uh, to use a mix of technologies, not just get caught with one. Uh, we need validation of newer technologies at what point and cri uh, or criteria or the, uh, to select one over the other and imp interoperability questions. We got a lot of charts, we're gonna go on and on. Um, and a VR and AR should be just one component of a larger program. If the program's not integrated and doesn't work together, the individual technological pieces are just gonna be, as we said before, just a fad. We need consensus and guidelines and a shared language. And uh, human factors design research is key in this because uh, bad VR is, can be really bad. Um, you need to consider uh, age, uh, at what age you can start using VR in children. Um, and uh, we need just good basic science research. Um, so we, we talked a lot about a lot of specifics we don't need to go into in particular to do an overview on this. But um, uh, did you wanna, okay, okay. yeah. Exactly, we need to, right, need to be aware of the harmful effects uh, of VR and to, to make sure those are well studied. Um, I guess they gave, an, they gave one example where there's a VR for pain program that uh, first had uh, just treatment as usual and then one with a walk in the city and then one with a walk at a countryside or a beach or something. And um, the walk in the city apparently increased anxiety, didn't decrease anxiety, whereas the walk in the beach decreased anxiety. So you have to be careful, do no harm. Uh, with your VR, or at least learn how your VR is going to implement, uh, is going to impact on the uh, on on the people you're trying to help. 
Uh, what are the priorities? Uh, industry moves at a faster pace than academia. Uh, industry moves at a, a you know, move fast and break things approach and academia moves at funding for <laughs> next year and the next five years and, and, uh, and research studies are slow and take a long time. And uh, we've run into this just doing VR as we've gone through several headsets just for one product. Uh, and we always have to upgrade and upgrade and upgrade and is that gonna change outcomes too? So uh, educational research. Um, and uh, can you start small and gain enough data to kind of do uh, uh, some pilot testing to, uh, to then uh, get a larger study to end up with a, with a larger clinical trial? Uh, and, uh, and above all, uh, use quality experts. Use your, uh, um, uh, uh, don't, don't forget about QI. And finally, the need to build a program that meets multiple objectives uh, and, and determine how to communicate with your administration. Um, in order to uh, make the whole thing work together. And uh, anyone from the group want to, I, I really race through it, so who from the group, there were some really good illustrations, anybody want to make those? Oh. Okay, thank you. Excellent job, thank you to all our reporters. And now it is lunchtime, so uh, please take this next hour. Um, we have lunch being served right outside the uh, auditorium. And then uh, it is a full hour. So once you're done eating, um, please visit our vendors downstairs in the atrium. Again, they have some great software programs and things that they would like you uh, to trial and use. So lunch and then again, if you can, go downstairs and visit our vendors um, who are here with us today. We will meet back in this room at 1 p.m. All right. Enjoy your lunch, everyone.
Okay. Oh, this is very slick. All right, everyone. We're going to get started again. Okay. Did everybody enjoy their lunch? Yeah. All right. And don't worry. If you didn't have enough time for the vendors, we have three to five where you can go back down and uh, try out some of the software programs. So our next presentation is Creating a Center for Academic Innovation. And it's with pleasure for me to introduce Jeremy Nelson. Jeremy leads the XR initiative for the Center for Academic Innovation at the University of Michigan, where they are focused on bringing XR technologies for teaching and learning to all 19 schools and colleges in the Ann Arbor campus, as well as bringing XR to their over 10 million global learners. The XR initiative works with faculty to reimagine how they teach courses using technologies such as augmented and virtual reality for skill building, engineering, nursing, medicine, and social science. And he will be joined by one of his colleagues, Dr. Michelle Abersole, who's been with us for three out of the four summits that we have. So it's a pleasure to have her back. She is a clinical professor at the University of Michigan School of Nursing and clinical associate professor in the School of Information. I've never heard of that, School of Information? Mm -hmm. yeah. She is a certified healthcare simulation educator and a fellow in the American Academy of Nursing. Dr. Abersold is also an XR faculty innovator in residence through the University of Michigan XR Initiative. So please give a warm welcome to Jeremy Nelson, Dr. Abersold. Thank you. Thank you. Great. The slides load up. Can we switch them over to the slides? No. Yep, not us. <laughs> uh, the laptop that's up here. There we go. Perfect. Thank you. I uh, appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity. We appreciate the trip out and sharing what we're doing and learning about all the other cool stuff that folks are doing at other institutions. Uh, again, my name is Jeremy Nelson. Uh, I'm our senior director of XR Media Design and Production. I'll talk a little bit about what the Center for Academic Innovation is. Yeah, it's a group at the University of Michigan that's focused on really solving big, complex problems. Uh, looking at things like access to high quality education, uh, providing personalized learning, and allowing folks to create kind of lifelong learning opportunities. Uh, so this center started about eight years ago with a focus to really design the future through research, innovation, experimentation, and iteration. Uh, so we are a, a central group on campus that supports a lot of work around, so we work with faculty to take their ideas and their courses and translate them into the open space. So we create a lot of massive open online courses or MOOCs uh, with partners like Coursera, edX, uh, and other partners like that. We have a whole team that creates educational technology. We have a whole software development team within our group that creates tools for faculty to use in courses. Uh, there's a, an application called Atlas that every student Derek was able to use this, one of our, our recent grads. So it allows the students, as they're registering for courses for the next semester, to look at all the analytics around the average grades that people got, what, what other courses did they take at the same time, what schools or programs were they in, what did they take after this class. So really uh, helping the, the residential program, uh, the students uh, enhance their educational journey. And then we have a whole R&D team that really looks at all this data that's coming from uh, the the open online learners. We've been creating MOOCs for about eight years. We have over 200 MOOCs uh, that are out there. Uh, we have just past 10 million unique learners have taken these courses in the last uh, eight years. Pretty broad impact from every country on the planet. Uh, and so we, we focus on the U of M faculty, staff, and students, global learners, and now a lot of companies are actually licensing our content for uh, skill building and kind of internal uh, training uh, on these platforms. And so uh, I started in the fall of 19. Uh, so people ask me a lot, like, how did, how did we get started? How did this get funded? It really came down to the provost. So before I got there, somebody had taken the provost to, he had did a lot of work with protein and drug development. And there was a startup in Ann Arbor that had created this whole VR simulation to explore proteins, put a headset on him, and he was blown away, right? It was in his area, it got him motivated. He's like, we need to be doing this. We need to be thinking about this more strategically. So we already have this center in place, kind of looking at curricular innovation. 
And so uh, our initiative incubated within the Center for Academic Innovation. It was a three-year funded initiative, really focused on bringing these technologies to campus, bringing them to our online learners, and then creating innovative public-private partnerships. So those were our three guiding you know, mission points. Uh, so I started in September of 19. We all know something happened in March. Um, <laughs> so we, we started to get traction, and then an interesting thing happened, uh, which brought a lot more interest, but un uh, unrealistic expectations. Oh, can we just start teaching the whole class in VR? Can we get all these students' headsets? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, we can't. Um, and so uh, a lot of things were already happening at Michigan before I started, so there was already fertile ground. There were faculty like Michelle doing work for years in this space. Uh, we had a faculty in our film, TV, and media course that had worked with a team on campus to recreate the last scene of the movie Citizen Kane in 3D. And so students, so they had, prior, they had this film class and they would have to write a paper about how would you reimagine the last scene of Citizen Kane and describe that, describe it. Uh, so they created an experience where you can go into the headset and you can operate the camera. There was an actor motion captured. The, if you recall, if you've seen the movie, the last scene is Orson Welles' character is like throwing a tantrum and flipping tables and, you know, it's right before the rosebud uh, scene. And so the, basically you can go refilm the last scene of the movie and you can export your clips and then go edit together a uh, presentation. So the assignment was not just reimagine it, but go refilm it. And so you can take the camera anywhere, you can put it in the ceiling, you can put it in the floor, you can put it behind the wall, you can do really interesting things. So students came up with, you know, much different ways. Like one student, like they never showed his face, so they wanted to like kind of hide the, the anger and all that stuff. And, and so the camera was actually modeled after the camera from the time we have a, somehow, there was a faculty that knew Orson Welles and he was gonna throw away all this stuff and he convinced them to give it to the faculty. The faculty, when they passed away, they donated to the university. So we have this whole collection of like manuscripts and photos from the set and notes from the cinematographer. So they used all of that to kind of recreate the scene accurately and the type of camera and all that. So it's pretty cool. Uh, we had folks in our medical school, we actually helped with this, but they were, they were experimenting in a different way. So one of the challenges that students had during peak COVID was the med students weren't able to do their ward rounds. And so they weren't able to follow the physician around and they had tried some things or taping a GoPro on somebody's chest and going into the rooms. And so we had a few HoloLenses and we partnered with them to use the Microsoft HoloLens with a program called Remote Assist. It basically lets you join a Teams call from the HoloLens and share the cameras and share your view. So the physician would go into the patient room and stream out everything. So all the other students were on a Zoom call or a team call so they could still participate. They could ask questions. The person wearing the headset, we could, they could project holographic windows in the display. And so they had up the medical record, they had up CT scans, x-rays, and did a whole international collaboration with folks at the Imperial College of London, where we brought med students from Michigan into a COVID case in London, Imperial students into a double lung transplant patient case at Michigan. So some proof of concept work, which is pretty cool. And then on the whole other spectrum, uh, we have faculty in the English department that were exploring using uh, virtual reality, augmented reality for teaching about storytelling and perspective. And, and her whole take is that novels have been immersive technologies for hundreds of years. You just have to use your mind to imagine the story. Now that we, we can create these environments and create these experiences, what does that do to narrative and storytelling? Uh, so, so they would read, novels and short form content and then go into the VR lab and explore a lot of content uh, that's commercially available. Uh, we have an XR curriculum at the university which helps tremendously. So there was already in the works before I started an XR graduate certificate program. So any student in a master's program in their second year can enroll in an XR graduate certificate program. Uh, so they have to take 12 credits. They have to do a capstone project, an internship, and then throughout the a number of our schools offer a course kind of throughout the, the year uh, that they can take to count toward that certificate. Uh, in parallel to that, we had created one of our MOOCs was called Extended Reality for Everybody. This is available on Coursera today. It's free, anybody can take it. Uh, it's broken into three courses uh, about the knowing, doing, and shaping the future of XR. So if you're really interested in like, what is, how does all this stuff work? What are the fundamentals? Like the first course is a great place to start. Um, it really talks a lot about 
you know, how the projection works, and trying to make it accessible for everybody, right? You don't have to have a lot of prior knowledge and understanding of the technology. And so I'll, this is a video of one of the courses. So he actually is in a headset teaching, so he's just showing some of the behind the scenes of how we produce the course. Um, so he's using an application called Tilt Brush, which is a 3D drawing application to teach about this uh, augmented virtual reality spectrum. So there's a whole spectrum where you think of like reality on the left all the way to virtual reality on the right. And kind of in between is this mixed reality or augmented reality space where you're, you're, you're still interacting with the real world uh, and bringing digital objects to that. Uh, and he's very goofy and funny, so you'll laugh a lot uh, the way he talks. Uh, during When we all got sent home, one of the things I wanted to do was uh, document all of the great work happening at Michigan before we got there. So we created a podcast and interviewed faculty and alumni doing XR work. We had 27 episodes, uh, so they're out on all the uh, podcast platforms today. So you can hear about some of the work that the individual faculty were doing. They're all audio podcasts, um, so we didn't have a lot to show video-wise at that time. And so one of the, th when we started, we modeled the structure that our center had been doing creating these MOOCs was we set up a seed fund approach. So we had funding to give out to faculty. And so we put out calls for proposal where faculty would pitch us on ideas and how they would want to use the technology in the classroom. And at the root of all of their proposals had to be what are the learning goals and objectives? And how are we going to measure the, the impact of these uh, experiences or these solutions? I was able to hire two full-time people and so one of the things I realized as we were evaluating what we had at Michigan was we need content. Content is key to keep these devices, you know, people using them, coming back to what Daniel was saying earlier, is like not these one-off projects. How do we have enough on these devices to keep them uh, useful? And so I decided to hire two developers and create some content, but not everything had to be created in-house. So it was a balance for us. If we create some things, we'll partner with companies, we'll leverage platforms, we'll look at different solutions. And so faculty, we ran our, a round of funding in, started in the fall of 19, and we've run another round, and then we just opened up another round last week, so we've done three rounds of funding. So far, we've received 34 proposals. Uh, we funded 25 of those projects uh, from 13 of the 19 schools, so pretty broad interest across the institution. You see a lot from architecture, engineering, our liberal arts college, nursing, medicine, a lot of folks that are kind of dealing in three-dimensional space or kind of thinking spatially already, leaned in heavily, but also interesting with our, the law school and our school of music and social work, uh, and I'll describe some of those projects here in a moment. The key to a lot of this was that we have been able to hire student fellows and teach them how to build these experiences or design them or prototype and storyboarding, so we ran it my background is in software development, so we ran it like a, a software development. We did design sprints, we do code reviews, status reports, and so we were able to plug the students into our workflow, kind of teach them the skills that they would learn to, if they wanted to go do this in industry. And so some of the examples of, they helped us with storyboarding, they've done uh, mock-up designs of user interfaces. Uh, just recently we've been ex experimenting with these metahumans, so these digital humans, and so that's uh, one of our students, Jackson. He made it metahuman of himself. <laughs> and so uh, and then you can animate that and include it into these experiences. We have folks from architecture, engineering, education, business, our school of music, so pretty broad uh, interest. Uh, we actually did win an Epic Games mega grant to help support that, to hire students to teach them how to develop VR with Unreal Engine. So that helped fund a lot of this. So how do we fund these things or where does it come from? It's kind of a mix of internal, external partnerships with vendors. Um, there's also, we had students creating uh, Instagram filters for our social media department. So that is augmented reality. They just don't call it, you know, they don't call it AR. But these, all these filters, that's AR. And so I won't keep it on there too long because it's creepy. Um, <laughs> uh, so in that first round of funding, we funded eight projects. And I really wanted to establish a process of how do we develop these experiences? How do we document that? How do we go through this kind of design iteration? And so we picked four large VR projects. Um, we did them all at the same time. We probably wouldn't do that again. So every two weeks, we were switching to a different project and doing these development sprints. And it was a lot. So we made a little bit of progress on all of them, but it took over a year to kind of finish these because we didn't have dedicated effort on one project for three or four months. So one of the projects Michelle can talk a little bit about later, but we created a chemotherapy simulation called Getting Under the Skin. Uh, she can describe that in a moment. We worked with our physics department to recreate one of the 
the lab experiments they did in person uh, about projectile motion. The faculty was like, we've been launching hockey pucks across the room for 50 years. Could we do something more interesting? <laughs> um, and yes, we did. Uh, we had an active nuclear reactor on campus for 50 years. It had been decommissioned in 2003. They were not going to bring it back. We we're not going to build a new reactor, but we could build a digital twin of that and have students go run simulations in a virtual reactor. <laughs> And then we worked with a, a faculty in construction archi in architecture, construction architecture, where he would teach students how to build with glass, steel, concrete, and wood. And the biggest challenge is there's 100 students in the course. They were never able to kind of go on site to see, you know, you couldn't take that many students onto a site. Maybe you couldn't find the right time in the construction build when they were dealing with the steel beams. And so we've integrated this directly into the curriculum. So he gives a lecture about glass or steel and then the students go to the VR lab the next, that week and they work through the, the steel module within it. So it's like this big museum and there's these design challenges and you can interact with the materials. So it was all kind of a really cool collaboration between his students. So that project, we funded some money for him to hire grad students and to build all of the environments and all of the beautiful imagery. And then he worked with our team to build that into the Unreal Engine, create the interfaces, how to do the learning design, how do we assess how the students are doing. And so I don't know if you want to talk briefly about the under the skin here, if you were going to talk about it later. I'll talk about it later. Okay, all right. So there's just some images. Michelle will talk about that later in her part. Uh, so there's a visual of our nuclear reactor. So they can run simulations and then something, you know, talked about earlier, dangerous or impossible. Uh, the students can go down into the reactor core and see what's happening when that part of the simulation is happening. So stuff you wouldn't do in real life because you would die. Um, but <laughs> You can do that. I mean, you could do it. You wouldn't live very long. Um, and so we can do it in VR. Uh, and it's really interesting the way that the whole project's come about. We started off, these two freshmen took photos and drawings and 3D modeled the entire space, which is amazing. Uh, and then over time, we've been able to add detail and texture to that. Our first, one of our first iterations, we were all so excited. We were like, look at what we did. And one of the nuclear faculty had been there forever. She's like, it was never that clean. There was crap all over the floor, and there were scratches <laughs> on the walls, and the cables laying everywhere. So one of the students we hired, he's like, he loved this. So he went through and added all those cables and scratches on the floor. And his whole philosophy was like, if, if we can make it look more realistic, you won't notice. But if you're looking for it, you will notice some of that detail. So when you're in there, you don't notice that all that detail is there, kind of the Disney approach to the level of detail. Uh, this is our physics lab project. So they launch rockets. Uh, and they can launch them on Earth, Mars, and the Moon, so they can see the different effect of gravity. Uh, they can adjust the launch angle and the velocity. And one of the challenges that the faculty had was they, they wanted the students to still get all the raw data from their experiment and then go outside of VR and graph it and do all the calculations. Obviously, we could do all that in here. Uh, so we came up with this concept called the Trans Reality Notebook. And so we're able to, when they log in, they type in their email address and it connects to their Google Drive. And so if, after they're done running the experiment, all the results get saved to a Google Sheet. So they can access it outside, which is pretty cool. Uh, and this is the construction architecture. So there's these big cavernous spaces where they go through and they have all these design challenges. So like in the wood, they can see how plywood is made or they can inter see how fireproof wood is constructed. And so they go around almost like a museum and explore through this and then we collect data on did they answer the questions right? How long did they spend in there? So some, and then also doing the surveys, so that kind of combined approach that Daniel was talking about earlier today. We ran another round of funding last year, so we wanted to continue the effort, but we didn't have any more development capacity, so I made the requirement that they had to bring a commercial authoring tool to their proposal. So we, we could provide some light project management, but we couldn't do any more development because we were still working on the other projects. So we had uh, a number of HoloLens 2 projects. We had a mobile AR project in architecture. And we had a number of folks use interactive, three, so you talked about the 360 videos. Are great. I think of that as like VR Lite. It's like get you started. You can still access it in a browser or a mobile phone. And so we found a platform that allowed us to create interactive experiences on top of the 360 photos and videos. And it had voice recognition part of it and this whole rules engine where you could basically say, if they say this keyword or this keyword, then do this, make text pop up or change scenes. It's been really powerful. Now our team isn't even involved. The learning designers and the faculty just take it and run with it, which is great. 
One of them was uh, Korean language studies. So they, that faculty was actually in Seoul, Korea. And so she filmed a bunch of scenes at a mall and a shopping center. And so the students get to practice, practice speaking Korean and it tells them if they got it right or wrong. That platform uses the Microsoft um, Azure services voice recognition and it has like 15, 20 different languages uh, that you can convert, which is pretty cool. Uh, we had, I won't go through all of this, but we had two students recreate the center of our campus uh, in VR. And so this is on the Microsoft Altspace uh, platform. It was an architecture student and an art student, and they worked together to recreate what we call the Diag. It's the center of our campus. And so they modeled all of the buildings around this square and uh, recreated it uh, in 3D so it could be brought into platforms like Altspace and Spatial and other things like that. So you'll see right here, uh, that's a digital version. And we've, since then, we've even made it more realistic and changed the trees and added more texture and depth to it. Uh, I'll go past that. Uh, and so one of the most exciting projects we've been working on was with uh, some colleagues of Michelle's. Uh, they came to us and said, hey, we have all these uh, students that need to learn basic skills in the, with the mannequins in the Sim Center. We don't have enough faculty, we don't have enough time, all these students coming, and is there anything we can do with this technology to support that? And so we consult with them and talked about how they did the training today, like the faculty would stand with the students and, and teach them the procedures, and you know, so they only had so many students they could support. And we had a HoloLens, and we'd heard about this program called Microsoft Dynamics 365 Guides. So this is a tool that's off the shelf, it basically lets you author step-by-step -step instructions that project into the, into the HoloLens. And it was mostly being used in automotive and manufacturing and kind of how to, how to maintain machinery and things like that. We're like, well, this is the same. They already had all the procedures. Step one, this is how you do a lumbar puncture. This is how you do a thoracentesis. That was already documented. And they wanted to standardize the learning, uh, have it be flexible, guided by evidence. So. Uh, the student will go into the Sim Center. There's a QR code next to the mannequin. The headset looks at the QR code and it pops up and says, do you want to do lumbar puncture? Do you want to do thoracentesis? And we actually had some students work to develop these guides and test it. And Derek is actually one of the recent grad students that he helped create that. He happened to be in New York uh, now. And so I invited him to come see today. So he worked with the faculty to create the experiences, bring the models in. And I'll show you a video here in a second. Uh, so this is a lumbar puncture procedure. This is a person with a task trainer wearing a HoloLens. And this is the view from the HoloLens of what they see. And so that you can bring in images, photo, or videos. Uh, step two, you know, the identify L3, L4. You see there's a hologram of the spine that's projected over that. There's identifying L3 and L4. So they're hands-free. They can still interact with the uh, mannequins but it's augmenting their, their learning experience. It's all self-guided. So the goal is to be do as much self-guided as possible. Shows them where the uh, syringe is, guides them back to the place where they need to place it. And so the goal now is the students can go in self-directed, do it as many times as they want. When they get to the end of the, the experience, it says, do you feel confident you could do this on your own? If you say no, you do it again. And now, uh, now instead of the faculty doing kind of one-on-one -on -one or one-on multiple training, the students go through it as many times as they want. And when they're ready, take the headset off. Okay, now come test me. Early findings are reduced faculty time by 75%, increased student confidence by almost double. They can make all the mistakes and nobody's, nobody's watching. <laughs> <laughs> At least someone's not looking over the, the data, the headset's watching, but we're not talking about that. So I'll turn it over to Michelle. Okay, thank you. So um, I'm going to divert just a little bit and talk about some of the projects that I've been involved in. Most of this is sort of in the uh, virtual reality, uh, but I feel like I've been on this journey for a while. So I actually started off my VR days in Second Life for anybody who's old enough or been around long. Yeah, right. Exactly. So yeah, I mean, it was like really cool. I learned so much about, you know, VR and, and avatars and all of that through that and then started kind of, you know, headsets became more commercially available, and so now it was time to really sort of jump into that whole uh, virtual environment. So Jeremy mentioned sort of that spectrum of the realities. Uh, Milgram is, you know, probably the, the name that comes to mind when people think about that. So a lot of my work has really been more towards the 
light <laughs> VR, as uh, we call 360, and then more of the immersive VR. Although I did some early work with AR, uh, but lately most of my stuff's been in immersive. So just a few of the projects that I've been involved in that really Jeremy's team and guidance have been really important uh, in terms of getting this stuff developed. So one of the things that I was really interested in doing was how can we use VR in the classroom? How can we support learning? And even doing things as simple as looking at combining a commercial VR experience called Everest, where the students could actually go in and climb Mount Everest all the way from base camp to summit. Then, after they've had that immersive experience, then I would have them play the Harvard simulation of uh, Ever Everest, just to sort of look at that whole sort of teamwork environment. And what the students found was those that had done the virtual Everest really felt like they understood the dangers and the challenges at climbing Mount Everest, and their teams did better than the, the students that hadn't taken advantage of the uh, virtual experience. So that was sort of a cool way to do things. And then moving into the VR, that sort of 360 space. Um, talked a little bit about this earlier with one of the, the breakout sessions. But the whole idea of creating these kind of immersive experiences, you know, how can you sort of get into that patient care situation and sort of see it from a perspective of sort of the action is around you? And you know, you just kind of stand there and sort of observe and see what's going on. And so I've had a couple of grants from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services to actually create these virtual environments. And I've done one for veterans and one for caring for patients who are deaf and hard of hearing. And so we use this as really um, an opportunity to sort of let the students really kind of immerse themselves into the action. And in honor of Veterans Day, that is actually my daughter, who is a lieutenant commander in the Navy Reserves right now. And we got her to, uh, thank you. Yeah. So we got her to agree to uh, be in one of our uh, videos. And so again, using things like green screen technology, they were able to film me standing there sort of doing this uh, introduction. And then the nice thing about 360 video, like we've said before, is you can view it on a screen. You won't get that level of immersion, but you can also view it on your phone, in a Google Cardboard. Uh, I did a talk with uh, Daniel out in uh, France, and I brought a bunch of Google Cardboards, and people were really amazed by, you know, sort of how interactive and how cool that was. So the power of, I think, 360 video, again, we talked a little bit about sort of how do you align the learning with, you know, the technology. And so again, this just sort of role models, this sort of interaction that occurs between a provider and a patient, and how sometimes if you are sort of to, um, yeah, there you go, move around in the scene, you'll see oftentimes where is our provider? Our provider is often right at the computer, typing in a bunch of stuff, maybe not making eye contact with the patient. And so the whole scene sort of unfolds around that. At the same time, we're also sort of role modeling when you're caring for a veteran. What are some of the things you may want to do that might look different than when you're caring for a civilian patient, particularly because many of our veterans get their care outside of civilian hospitals. So again, it was just sort of this experiential, I thought sort of a, a cool project. And it's uh, been, it's there, all the videos are available on a website and it's been sort of uh, utilized now in uh, several different areas. Uh, so also did the same thing on uh, caring for patients who are hard of hearing. The videos are freely available, so you know, feel free to stop by. We'll be down at the vendor booth, so feel free to stop by. I'm happy to give you that information in terms of where to get them. So I think I already talked about this. Um, but again, the, the nice thing is that you can view them in many different ways. The disadvantages, particularly when it's just the 360 video, there's not a lot of interaction. Although there are platforms you can put them in to sort of get more of that interaction or maybe unfolding case stories. The other two uh, immersive projects that I'm just gonna talk a little bit about before I turn it back over to Jeremy are looking at doing sort of pediatric advanced life support. And one of the things that I found in working with the IMPACTS program and all of that is in going to critical access hospitals, 
people need to know how to use their cognitive aids. How do you use your uh, proposal cards? How do you use your algorithms? And so we have a very basic scenario. It's just single player, not a lot of um, fluff to it. However, it sort of gets at the basics of sort of you go into your environment, you have your little card. We keep the uh, thing up there to show the students how to use the handsets because we weren't really expecting that these folks were going to come in and know a lot or understand a lot. Things are mostly automated, but the goal is for them to be able to go into the environment. They can kind of look around and they see they have different tools, like they can get an EKG and they'll actually uh, get a rhythm strip that'll come out and be uh, within their little card deck and their controllers. They can turn the monitor on, they can assess their child, they can listen to heart and lung sounds. And then when it comes to, it, it takes about three minutes and then the rhythm will change. And so we have one that goes in bradycardia, one that goes into tachycardia, and then one that goes into pulseless VTAC. And then they have to kind of go and they have to look at their medications. They can pull up and visually look at uh, a recreation of the Brozo cards or the algorithms, and then sort of kind of problem solve and figure out just where how they want to treat the patient. And then if they're successful at the end, the baby kind of wakes up and starts crying. Uh, so again, it's, um, it's a sort of an introduction or sort of a first step at that. And I'm actually looking forward to kind of having some people test it out and then see how we can enhance and, and take it further. So that's just a little recreation of the cards. And then the other project that uh, Jeremy alluded to was under the skin. So I'm actually just going to kind of start the video and talk a little bit about this. So. The other area that I work a lot in is this whole area of patient safety and even looking at our providers and how they make sure that they're delivering care and protecting safety to themselves. We know that nurses and pharmacists who handle chemotherapy have a higher rate of cancer than others. We've been doing this uh, in-person training where we bring people in and talk to them about you know, how do you apply your PPE and take it off correctly to avoid contaminating yourselves. And then we've talked to them also about managing oncology emergencies. So things like sepsis, hypersensitivity, and in particular, extravasations. And so this was developed and it sort of has this magic school bus. That was my thing that I brought to Jeremy. It's like, I want a magic school bus. I want to be able to go inside the human body and I want them to see, as you're seeing here, what happens when doxorubicin extravasates and gets at the cellular level. And so this whole little experience, there's two scenarios, is to really sort of take them in, have them identify there's a problem, have them see how it damages the body, both internally and the external, and then they have to uh, apply the correct treatment. So we'll have these downstairs later if you guys want to come down and experience them. Uh, Under the Skin's also available on the App Lab, so it's something that you can, uh, you, you can get for free as well. So back to Jeremy to talk a little bit about sort of uh, round this out with some discussion about our collaborations in that. Great. As you can see, filming in VR, you have to be careful with your head. Your head is the camera, so you move too fast, and it looks crazy when you're watching the video. Um, so, uh, so we've done a lot of external collaboration. Um, really interested. We've had a number of conversations with Randy from Yale and talked with a lot of folks uh, overseas, like we mentioned. There's so many of us doing things, as Daniel talked about, like collaborating together, the more I think we can do. So we reduce duplication and kind of leveraging these different platforms and solutions. Uh, there's a group called the XR Association. So they're a trade group of all the big vendors. They're doing a lot of work around policy and legislation. It's always a mixed bag, right? The vendors trying to influence policy, but like trying to get in there and, and bring the education perspective. Kind of what are the things that are important to us in terms of Title IX and uh, the Civil Rights Act and uh, FERPA and HIPAA and all those good things. Uh, I've been working with folks uh, from Georgia Tech and the New School, holding a couple privacy and security talks through EDUCAUSE, uh, working with the NHS. So all the work we were doing with the guides, the National Health Service in the UK is very interested in that as, I don't know how much you know about all the politics there, but when they Brexited, many of their healthcare workers were from Europe and they didn't come back. And so there's a huge healthcare shortage of workers there. And so they're looking at tools like this to train their workforce. And so we're looking at uh, doing a large study with them to see how well do these skills translate uh, across seas. And they, 
they have access to much larger population, you know, they can kind of control a whole group, uh, can do the study, right, because they're paying for everything, uh, different than here. Uh, and then we just partnered with the University of Maryland for an NSF grant to really study medical innovations in XR um, with corporate partnerships, uh, and that just kicked off uh, last month. And one of the things we did during COVID, when people were asking me, oh, can we teach the whole class in VR? Can we do this? Uh, we were like, not yet. Uh, but we did purchase 20, so we started small. We purchased 25 Quest 1s. Two weeks later, the Quest 2 came out. Um, but that was fine at the time, because I didn't need a Facebook account to use them. So we wanted to make them available for faculty that were interested in that. And so we came up with this whole protocol. We bought one of these clean boxes, a UV box, to clean the device. We partnered with our library system to handle a whole contactless checkout. And we had two classes. One class taught, it was, a, uh, it was an educational technology school of ed class. And they actually checked them out. And they had the students kind of meet up uh, in Altspace and meet up in some of these other platforms. And at the time, it was a great way for the students to reconnect when they had been completely remote. Um, and so students were able to come to the library and pick them up. And we had to ship a couple out. Um, and so over time, that interest has grown. Now we have over 100 headsets that we check out. We have a few, we don't have 100 HoloLenses. We have four HoloLens 2s, <laughs> uh, 100, about 100 Quest 1s and Quest 2s that we check out. I'm actually teaching a course this semester. And so we gave all the students a headset for the semester. It's an application design uh, XR design course. Um, we have an annual XR Summit. We're going to host our next one April 18th and 19th. We'll be sending out messages about that so folks are interested. Let us know. We'll be inviting, similar to this, be having folks from different institutions and our faculty and discussing. And we'll have a whole student showcase where students can show off their works and vendor booth uh, as and try on, yeah, trying on the, try, like downstairs, go try this stuff out because there's, you can see all the cool videos and you can hear us evangelize about it. But until you do it, if you've never done it, it's, I can't convince you uh, how cool it is. I won't play this whole thing, but one of the things we're doing now is really, since we create all of those MOOCs and those online courses, if you've been watching any of the video production work that's been happening in Hollywood with The Mandalorian and all these new TV shows, they're using these big LED screens behind the actors, and they're, real, they're projecting real-time 3D environments into those scenes and live compositing them into these worlds. And so we did a proof of concept with that architecture. So I'm standing on an LED stage, real-time compositing that uh, construction architecture course. So we're going to. We're building one of these studios, and we're going to start creating next generation online content uh, that looks like Hollywood without millions and millions of dollars. <laughs> I won't say the studio didn't cost that, but uh, ongoing costs was say. <laughs> won't be <laughs> that high. Uh, and some of that was uh, started by this partnership with Coursera. So we're partnering with them to create 10 XR enhanced online courses. So when I talked in the beginning about our three goals, we're bringing these technologies on campus, bring them online in innovative public-private partnerships. We knew in the beginning, like, we couldn't get headsets to people. People don't have headsets. They're still a bit cost prohibitive. A lot of our uh, online learners, like, they just use a mobile phone, right? They don't have, they may not have great bandwidth and internet connectivity. So we think a lot about accessibility. And so we're creating 10 XR enhanced courses. So they are MOOCs at the root, but they will have these interactive experiences that are part of the course. And so primarily we're focusing on interactive 360 video, like we showed before. Mobile AR, so, and we're going to be learning and exploring, like, do people access these? What do they access them from? Where do they access them from? Uh, that virtual production, so it'll still be video, but we'll be using XR to create the content. And then kind of the, the most difficult one will be this immersive VR, the headset VR. And we'll probably be focusing on corporations that already have headsets. So Walmart has four VR headsets in every store in America. I don't know if you knew that. They train a lot of their staff on things like, uh, they call it Holiday Rush, the day after Thanksgiving. 43% uh, of their employees have never lived through one of these. Walmart has a lot of turnover. Uh, <laughs> this happens once a year. It's hard to train for it, so they created a whole 360 video experience to practice that, practice stocking certain shelves. Bank of America has a headset in every branch. They do a lot of HR training, soft skill training in that. So those companies, Accenture bought 60,000 headsets. They onboard all their new employees bit of a marketing. I talked to them. They're like, we don't actually use the headset. Um, <laughs> it's all about the content. They do it once, and then they don't come back to it. And there's not something that brings them back all the time. Uh, and so then we've been exploring these other soft skills or critical skills, role playing, simulations, um, as opportunities uh, to take it to the next step. 
So just to kind of wrap things up here, um, just want to sort of underscore the importance of partnerships. And I think, you know, we've heard that a lot today. This is one of those things where it is difficult to do on your own, obviously. So developing collaborative partnerships, whether it's internally through uh, folks like Jeremy, or whether it's externally through folks like Daniel. <laughs> Uh, it, it's really, I think, one of the things that we're going to need as we move forward. If we think about some of the uh, early days of simulation and how, you know, you were like the lone person in your sim lab and you had to depend upon other people, that'll be important. This uh, faculty innovator in residence, I'm going to just um, talk uh, just for a few minutes about that. The really nice thing about that, there are now three of us that at U of M that are faculty innovator in residence. It is a uh, sort of a year-by-year -year commitment, and it's myself, Michael, and Jonathan Rule. And one of the nice things is, is we meet with Jeremy, we sort of advise from a faculty perspective on things, we get some sort of insider knowledge, a little insider support where we need it, and really try to work through some of the infrastructure. I mean, I think we've talked a lot this uh, conference about infrastructure and how important that is. If we don't create some of that infrastructure to sort of underpin this, then it's going to be difficult uh, for us to move forward. So one of the things that I think is also important is how can we continue to use external grant funding and think about ways where these tools really do apply to some of the needs that we have going on right now. We've talked about procedural training. One of the things that I have a, a new project uh, that I'm collaborating with folks from Minnesota and Purdue around is basically creating multi-patient scenarios that we will be using for senior level nursing staff. Again, it's one of the things where it's, when you're doing your training as a nurse and your undergraduate, you might get to take care of one or two patients. You don't always get to see all the different kinds of patients you'll experience. And this is one of those great examples where trying to do a multi-patient simulation in your sim lab is really super challenging, requires a lot of folks. So we partnered with a company and we're actually building multi-patient scenarios right within virtual reality. So I think it's a great application of VR. And so we'll kind of see where that goes. Uh, but again, just really looking at opportunities to leverage something that'll be great for patient care, something that'll be great for training, and I think it'll also be something that will be good for onboarding uh, new staff in hospital settings, which again, we know that we have this huge nursing shortage out there. And one of the collaborative pieces is with that grant, she got 35 headsets. Oh, yeah. Per We're school. We're not stuck on a desk, in her, or not stuck in her office, so we've partnered. So we manage, the, our team manages the headset as part of our larger headset management. Yep. She basically, we have a handshake agreement. She's like, you can use them for whatever you want, but when I need them, you need to get them back to me. That's so, right, yep, exactly. So we have this, we're managing them. So we have other faculty who want to use them or short periods of training with HR and things. Yep. We can kind of handle that piece. She doesn't have to worry about that, keeping them updated and all that fun stuff. And the other advantage is now that he's a real center and he has real funding and real people, we use some of our grant funding to purchase time from his department to help support setting up the headsets, setting up the whole sort of deployment of these virtual sims as they are created. Something that I could have never done on my own and sort of really requires that partnership. So again, ways to sort of incorporate grant funding into some of these different areas and always buy lots of toys. I think we're ready for questions. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Of course, we might be at a point where all the questions are, you know. <laughs> you can also just shout them out. Yeah, right. If you don't want to get up. You don't want to get up, right, post lunch. We were so awesome, you have no questions. We answer all your questions ahead of time. And there's my contact info if you want that. Yeah. Oh, yeah, great. Question. Great. All right. <laughs> um, so, so is it, so you guys make it look so easy, right? The leadership just is totally convinced that this XR stuff is all the way to go. 
now you're like snickering, so maybe that's not true. So how do you make the case to leadership to continue this support? You know, we've, we've talked about like grants are great, but grants come and go. Yep. So, so what's, what's a, how are you making the case for this to become part of the DNA? Of, We're on our of, third provost since I started. Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, they don't go. remember. I, I, um, yep. I mean, I think the, the having that center for academic innovation that already existed, that we actually do generate revenue from the MOOCs. So there is already a business case for the, you know, the revenue generation. That's the, and the faculty already doing, we had 18 faculty already on campus doing stuff. Part of our role was to kind of convene them and create the, you know, kind of the networks and things like that. So I think... It's showing the use cases of those first set, how people are using it, people getting additional funding, having a, we have a team of five now. So we have two full-time developers, a 3D artist, a project management, project lead to help manage all these projects, and then me. And so I think it's just, it's kind of, I don't know, like it's hard to replicate because that, that center was already there. And as we just kind of expand the services out of that center. The other thing that I would say too, in addition to that is, when you think about change, when you think about, so let's just go back and look at mannequin based sim because many of us understand what that looks like. Not everybody, but, but many of us that have been in that space. When we first started it, you know, you had a mannequin and a person and you had nobody to help you. Now, I dare you to walk into any health profession school like medical schools and nursing schools and not see a simulation center that's fully embedded into the program and into the curriculum. And I think we need to look at leveraging XR in the same way. So as we build the things that we're building, like the dynamic guides, this is now part of the graduate level curriculum. So it's a little harder to take it away when we can demonstrate outcomes, when we can sort of embed it into the curriculum. Now we, and we have a place that can provide us some infrastructure support. It still doesn't quite answer the funding question because there are still pieces that we're working on like headset replacement or you know, licenses and things like that. But I think it's demonstrating it works and then tying it into the curriculum in a way that it is difficult to pull back out and then not making it about one particular faculty member so all of the faculty that are involved in this course where they do the skills training all know how to use this and all agree to use this and support each other. So I don't know that we have all the answers, but I think we're trying to do some of that. But I would say hardwired in to the extent you can. You know, you know the adage, ask for forgiveness instead of permission, right? <laughs> Embedded in such a way that somebody has to work hard at taking it out. And we, we live out, we, we're not in IT, so we have a little more flexibility, but I work really closely with the medical center IT, with our central IT, yep. with our engineering. So developing really strong relationships there and supporting, you know, hey, we went through all of the procurement process properly to get licenses and make sure we protect the data and yep. we go through our information assurance review. So we're not like skipping around some of the, and that helps us build goodwill with mm -hmm. the IT team. Yeah, and including them. Not, not, not. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right? You find all these contracts that people signed, and you're like, "How did you commit us to that?" Great, great question, though. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll meet them up. Thank you both, that was great. Uh, next up, session number four is our own Columbia XR Showcase. Um, what is great about this is you'll see folks that are from different disciplines, different domains. We have folks from occupational therapy, um, computer science and engineering. Um, and this is what was really important, is collaborating across these different domains and coming together to work on these really amazing projects. Uh, the first project uh, we are going to highlight is Dr. Razan Hamed. Uh, Dr. Ahmed is Associate Professor at the Occupational Therapy Program at VPNS. She teaches various courses in research methods, diversity, equity, and inclusion. She is a member of the American Occupational Therapy Association, inaugural DEI committee, and serves on multiple committees that support 
DEI in education and practice. Uh, she has several projects in adapting, translating, culturally relevant assessment tools for occupational therapists. She's a strong advocate for enhancing empathy and cultural humility in occupational therapy education, research, and practice settings. She is also an awardee of the Computer uh, Columbia University uh, Emerging Technology Grant that's supporting this project. Um, and this grant is there to examine the effect of VR on enhancing students' empathy while learning the key concepts of DEI. Dr. Razan? Um, thank you, everyone, for staying over and for especially staying awake after lunch. I really appreciate it. Uh, am I using this one? How do I click the, the slide? Oh, yeah. Okay, so um, my project is, is a little bit different. It has a little bit different angle. It's not medical skills per se. It has an angle to enhancing the understanding of diversity, equity, and inclusion components, and as well as enhancing the sense of empathy in occupational therapy students. Um, it's really hard to see this, by the way. Slides, no problem. Just it's hard to see. Oh, here it is. So, um, the for those who may not be familiar with occupational therapy, it is a rehab um, uh, prof profession. We work with patients. We work with other healthcare professionals. Um, we work with uh, family um, caregivers. Um, um, so we are still in the medical realm. Um, however, we we do have. A big emphasis on um, oh, thank you on uh, equi uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. It is in our centennial vision as a profession. It is um, embedded in our code of ethics uh, for practice. So understanding, you know, how diversity, equity, and inclusion plays a role in our practice is very important in our education. Um, cultural humility is probably another term that is uh, very f um, uh, common in, in medical in the medical field. Um, however, diversity, equity, and inclusion education is very abstract in OT. It's also very um, um, elusive. You don't really know how to teach it to students and make sure that they understand it, they apply it when they talk to their patients. So it is a big challenge for OT educators how to make sure that our students have that cultural humility and have that understanding of all things D DEI. Um, our workforce, and I'm not sure, like you know, how the uh, how things look like in nursing and medicine, but we have um, a profession that the workforce of which is highly dominated by uh, white women. So a lot of times, students won't see other faculty members, students, and other healthcare professionals in the field that look like them or like they had to share the same faith or culture. So our a lot of our students don't really. Um, appreciate or know how to apl apply the cultural humility piece in their practice. So there are some concepts that are really uh, highly abstract to teach them, such as you know microaggressions, implicit bias, uh, racism. These become very abstract in the sense of like how do you apply that when you are treating a patient? So what does it mean to have cultural humility when you're working with a client that doesn't look like you? Um, so, uh, virtual reality seems to be a really good option for this agenda because talking about microaggressions and racism and all the, uh, the big scary concepts like, um, again, discrimination, stereotypes, uh, white fragility, racism, all of these are really awkward conversations to have with students. Students find them uncomfortable to talk about, faculty find them uncomfortable to talk about, so virtual reality, we found that it could be a great innovative way to teaching these abstract concepts that are still very critical in our field. So uh, we looked at VR and we thought that it could be one way also for educators to observe, observe students without being uh, too confrontational when we talk about these concepts. Uh, it does allow profound understanding of these concepts without putting the students on the spot without putting them, feeling them uncomfortable when we talk about these conversations in class. 
uh, it kind of also breaks the ice when we talk about these uh, conversations. So my project, I am using virtual reality um, in a course that is called Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Professional Skills. So it's making that connection between how do you become uh, a practitioner with good culture humility who understand these concepts while becoming, while also working with a client, working with their parents uh, or caregivers or family members. This course will be offered uh, in spring, uh, and the way we are doing it, we are um, having students work in, uh, in smaller groups that will go through these uh, virtual reality experiences, and then we will do a lot of discussion and reflection how that made them be aware more of you know, all things um, DEI. Uh, I'm working with our emerging technology team, which is a fantastic team that helped me so much exploring good options for, for this course. Um, and also navigating the, the technology itself. My outcomes will be mainly identifying and recognizing microaggressions when they see them, and the case studies that they will see during, during the, the virtual reality cases are very helpful, uh, and eventually I want them to have a better sense of empathy towards clients who don't look like them. So the sense is like, you know, using the virtual reality will lead to that outcome, Hi, I'm Sarah, oh. and welcome to this virtual reality learning experience on recognizing and this interrupting is, unconscious This is a synopsis thoughts. how the, um, look in the, mirror. the experience you. will look like, you so students will actually Tamara. feel Take a moment and see how your this body. avatar will look like. Stretch your arms, move them around, and get comfortable in your body. You are Tamara. In this experience, you'll be in a common workplace situation. First, you'll experience the situation from one perspective. Then, you'll get to experience the very same situation from a different perspective, and make some choices to see how different actions could have led to a more inclusive outcome. So as you can see, the In students will go through these case studies. They will also be provided, they will be prompted to pick an action, and this is the, where the learning piece comes in. So you are exposed to microaggressions or a bias or discrimination. How do you interact with that situation? And based on the student's uh, response, the scenario will continue. And after that, we will reflect, like, why did you pick this course of action? Why didn't you pick another course of action? And that will help them first identify, did you see what was wrong with the scenario? And once they do, what was it? And why was it wrong? Um, or what was the problem with it? So the, the clinical, re the critical reasoning piece, or like how this is expected to, to, to go, is first they will be exposed to that virtual reality case study. Uh, then that case study is supposed to help them uh, identify what was wrong, something like you know stereotyping, racial profiling, uh, microaggression, bias. Um, and then after that, they will help them articulate what was wrong with that comment that the manager, for example, said to, the, to Tamara. Um, and then ho hopefully this will help them build the ability to explain the problem itself and how, the, how will that affect them as a professional. So again, linking it back to the professional skills. And then after that, hopefully they will reflect on what was wrong and if they were in a simpler situation, how they would feel. Uh, or someone else uh, would feel if they were in that position. After that, the point is to change their actions. So if they were oblivious before to how they come across to a classmate or a client, now they will pay more attention to what they say and how they come across after going through that virtual reality experience. So eventually, again, this will hopefully get them to a better uh, uh, empathetic behavior that will be reflected in the professional communication with another uh, uh, person in the team. So again, the VRs will look like this. So you, they will have to observe whatever that's going on in, in, in that scenario. Each case study will allow the students to pick, again, a course of action. And once they click it using the controls, they will pick one of them, and then the scenario will continue based on that action. And this is a good, the, the good thing about this is it gives them the time to respond. So they will respond and reflect in real time how they want to uh, respond to what, what happened. 
Uh, so again, after the scenario is over, the, uh, the software itself will ask them, how did you feel about the choice that you made? Why did you make that choice? Um, um, do you think everyone was included? Do you think, so they ask questions about that specific uh, case study as well. So after, the, the, the good thing is uh, we start the class with these case studies and that kind of again breaks the ice about these conversations so we don't have to just lecture them about why microaggressions are bad or like, you know, what is wrong with, you know, a racist client or uh, uh, another like healthcare professionals making a racist comment or a joke or an inappropriate comment about someone. We start them with these uh, scenarios so a lot can happen before we even start talking about these problems in the classroom. So we, we, we will be talking about the diversity, equity, inclusion components. We'll talk about empathy skills, intersectionality, which is a big component in our OT education. Uh, we talk about you know, how these things also interact with social determinants of health, effective communication skills, and how we tie it all together. That was quick. Um, there was another video, but I don't see it here, but it's okay. Hold on, I think I can find it. Okay, I can't find the other video. Oh, maybe. What if? You could become another person. What if you could become a colleague, a peer, a manager, an employee, a stranger? What if you could experience the world from their perspective? To feel excluded, invisible, petit, powerless, silenciado, alone. What if? To increase awareness. To grow empathy. Practice behavior. For a breakthrough. For an aha moment. For understanding. For inclusion. For equality. For an equal reality. Oh, I get that all the time. Wow. So as you can see, uh, it gives the students the opportunity to picture themselves as someone else and how that would feel. and. It will, in our project, we will see where the students, where the students who relate to the avatar have a different reaction to the microaggressions witnessed in that scenario than someone who doesn't look like them. So there's a lot to be explored and a lot to be um, learned from, from using virtual reality in this sense. So it's, it's a non-tangible skill that they're learning. It is a soft skill, but also it's extremely uh, critical as a healthcare professional. Thank you. That's it. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Razan. Uh, we're actually going to hold questions at the end. We have this um, sort of quick round uh, of projects that we're showcasing. And then at the end, we'll take all the questions. So please hold on to your questions uh, for the end. For the next round of projects um, that we're working on at Columbia, I'd like to introduce Dr. Kess David Kessler, Dr. Robert Manneker, Dr. Steve Feiner, uh, who will be talking about applied XR in healthcare versus virtual reality defibrillator training for medical students. Uh, Dr. David Kessler is the Vice Chair of Innovation in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Columbia University, where he helps implement novel programs and guide strategy for complex problems. Dr. Kessler has dedicated his career to improving patient outcomes through leveraging novel technology. And as a co-founder of Columbia's Collaboratory for Extended Reality in Health Professions, he is currently working to develop and investigate sustainable and impactful XR educational interventions at the medical center. Dr. Kessler has a broad background in clinical research and an extensive record of education, grant funded research, and international leadership in the fields of simulation and emergency ultrasound. As an associate medical director for the Marion Michael Jaharis Simulation Center, 
Dr. Kessler has helped other departments to start new safety-driven simulation programs. And as a founder for Inspire, uh, the international network for simulation-based pediatric innovation, research, and education, Dr. Kessler helped to grow a community of simulation scientists dedicated to collaboration, mentorship, and scholarship. Uh, Dr. Steve Feiner is a professor of computer science at Columbia University, where he directs the Computer Graphics and User Interfaces Lab. His lab has been conducting AR and VR research for over 25 years, designing and evaluating novel 3D interaction and visualization techniques, creating the first outdoor mobile AR system using a see-through head-worn display and GPS and pioneering experimental applications of AR and VR to a wide range of fields. Professor Feiner is a fellow of the ACM and the IEEE and a member of the CHI Academy and the IEEE VR Academy. He is the recipient of the ACM uh, SIG CHI Lifetime Research Award, the IEEE ISMAR Career Impact Award, and the IEEE VGTC Virtual Reality Career Award. Together with his students and colleagues, he has won the IEEE ISMAR Impact Paper Award, the ISWC Early Innovator Award, and the ACM UIST Lasting Impact Award. Professor Feiner has served as a general chair or program chair for over a dozen ACM and IEEE conferences and is the co-author of two editions of Computer Graphics, Principles and Practice. Dr. Robert Manneker, uh, he joined the uh, faculty of the Department of Anesthesiology at CUIMC in January of 2011. He is an assistant professor of anesthesiology, a member of the Division of Orthopedic and Regional Anesthesia, and director of the Acute Perioperative Interventional Pain Service. He practices regional anesthesia and acute pain medicine, specializing in ultrasound-guided peripheral nerve blocks for the management of post-surgical pain. Please give them a round of applause, and thank you. <laughs> Woo, that was long. <laughs> that, that's the time, right? Yes, I know. That's true. <laughs> So we're gonna we're gonna showcase just one of our joint projects, but really this is a story about groups coming together. So I'm really I'm humbled by a lot of the talks we heard today and a lot of what's going on at other institutions. I feel very much at the beginning of breaking down those silos here, and um, this is really just going to be a story about us coming together over a few projects. So Rob, do you want to kick us off and sure. get the clicker here? Yeah. We're going to talk about one project in particular, but I'll set the stage a little bit just in how we came together uh, as collaborators. Um, as mentioned, um, I do, I'm an anesthesiologist and I do, uh, and Dave is an emergency physician, um, we both do a lot of simulation training, a lot of live sim training, and for those of you who aren't as familiar with it, this is, we're very fortunate in my department to have a live sim center. I showed a few folks yesterday our simulation center, and this is just a quick video of our uh, sim center. It looks a lot like any other live sim center where we have a, you know, patient, uh, we, in our case we have an operating room because most of the work we do is in operating rooms. We have an ICU, critical care room, we have uh, a room with task trainers. Um, I've been doing live sim training for about a decade and developed a, this big interest in, you know, why am I doing all of this stuff live that takes so much of my time um, and, you know, individual students' time where um, we could turn this all into VR. So through that, I'm just, sorry if that created any uh, motion sickness in anyone, but uh, <laughs> So, so I developed this interest in turning a lot of the, the live sim training that I was doing into a VR environment, started knocking on uh, Professor Feiner's door for, in a way, a few years, realized that Dave was doing the exact same thing out of the world of emergency medicine here at Columbia. So a few years in, we realized we, we, that the two of us have the same interests from the medical side, and, and Steve had that same interest in you know, creating projects that were medical related. Um, so the COVID pandemic actually jump-started this collaboration hugely because all of a sudden we had a lot of students um, who were working remotely 
uh, in studying remotely and with a big interest in creating projects that were relevant to the medical you know, community. Um, so, uh, you know, we, this is kind of our uh, kind of mission in a way. I'm not going to read that. Um, but again, um, the three of us came together uh, and started creating projects in the VR world, uh, utilizing students purely in the university environment. And these are kind of four of the projects that we've developed over the last few years, and we're just going to highlight one of them today. Um, one of them is, this is an anesthesia machine that's a mobile-based AR application. Um, there's an ultrasound trainer that's a VR application. The one we're going to highlight today is a defibrillator trainer that's maybe, you know, part of the wider world of ACLS. Um, and then the last one is a, uh, a trainer for a diagnostic exam under ultrasound. Dave, you want to talk about... Sure. Is this the one? Yeah. Um, yeah, and actually, before I get started, Steve, I don't know if you want to mention anything with regards to the courses that you ran, because I think this is also a story of pragmatics. We didn't start with a huge center grant. We, had, we were lucky to have support as well through Emerging Tech and uh, CUIT. But really, this is about creating the pipeline and laying that foundation right now um, with a lot of the blood, sweat, and tears of students and professors. <laughs> so. I that. Sure. So I teach courses on uh, designing, developing, evaluating uh, VR and AR uh, user interfaces. And what happened in the beginning of the spring of 2020, when the boom came down, so to speak, um, having been contacted previously individually by Rob and David, um, I realized that I wanted to, for the project component of the course that I was teaching that semester, have perhaps a project that they would essentially be the uh, subject matter expert advisors for. Um, and so I created a list of projects, one of which was the one with them. We had students who were interested in it. Uh, and uh, indeed, we were, courtesy of Zoom, able to collaborate much more efficiently than if we took the shuttle up to CUIMC and then took the shuttle back and then had like a 25 minute meeting during which we'd be watching our watches to make sure that we actually get the shuttle and not have to waste another half hour. So the idea that in part, Zoom kind of made possible some of the things that we did then and are doing now where I can have a student or two meet with two physicians and me all at the same time, which would probably be impossible because most of those meetings, at least one of the two of them is at home and I'm probably at home as well. And the students might be in their dorm rooms or whatever. So it's, it's just, I think, really interesting that in those projects which are oriented towards technical end of things, we're able to go and get all of us together and working on stuff. So I think this particular project grew out of a part of a course objective, which was to use the hand tracking. Um, and, and so, you know, of a list of procedures and wish lists that Rob and I would like to see done and developed, one of them was a simple training for the Zoll defibrillator. It, the defibrillator is incorporated into a lot of PALS and ACLS and teamwork trainings right now, but there's very little from that sort of like step-by-step walkthrough and how to use the equipment. And there are simulation-based studies that show that if you've actually just played with the knobs, your, your time to defibrillate, defibrillation in a real scenario actually decreases, so it improves outcomes. Um, this is uh, about defibrillator. We could skip that. Um, so our specific aim was really to just to start by investigating, to create this um, program, to investigate the feasibility and the usability and the likability by students of the VR training environment for, medical, uh, for the medical students learning how to use the defibrillator. And, you know, so the first step is, was just the asset creation. And, um, you know, the students very quickly were able to just um, develop this with some polygons. I think this is a video just showing a little bit of the, the flow. So just, again, just very basic assets. This is, uh, I believe, a Milstein room. <laughs> Not my world. I'm in pediatrics. Um, but you could see the education center in the background, the crash cart. Um, so we we're building it in a modular fashion so that down the line you could start to add other features. You can open the drawers in the crash cart. You can have the other things. Um, we started with a tutorial mode that you see here um, that will just walk them through all the nebology and actually connecting up the defibrillator. So an often missed educational step, which is when you get into the clinical environment, the thing's not plugged in all the time, especially with the pediatric pads. 
Um, so that's walking them through step by step where we're hands free using the hand tracking. Steps are displayed on an in game screen. And again, part of the goal here was not just the design. I actually imagine that this will be redesigned or obsolete within you know months or a year, depending on technology changes. But what we're doing in terms of the foundation and the infrastructure is we wanted to actually get this and test this within the curriculum. So we looked for a home for that. And a good one was our month long ready for residency course, which right now is largely simulation based and immersive, happens in the fourth year to prepare the fourth year medical students before they go out into their residencies. So um, one component of that is they actually, uh, we worked with AHA in that course and they get um, ACLS certification as part of it um, instead of doing a, a traditional AHA class. And what we wanted to do was just see, do students like this before we go any further, um, using a modified system usability scale and then measure no knowledge and confidence with the steps of using the defibrillator. So um, we had a medical student do this as part of a research project. Um, and, during, and during the course, we just found a half hour time slot in between simulations and had people volunteer to come into a space. Um, with CUIT support, we were able to have three um, Quest 2 uh, headsets and do three simultaneously to give us feedback on the experience. And our results are, are, are largely qualitative. So we had 26 participants sign up, um, which was a large proportion of the course. Uh, around half were female, mean age is 27 of our average medical student. Um, and 70% and, uh, of them had no prior VR experience. So this was also their first time with using virtual reality. But the majority of them, as you could see, found it really easy to use. They liked the experience, even though this is a really a pilot um, sort of beta version. Um, they found it realistic in terms of the steps that were being replicated. And they would recommend to sort of continue it. So that gave us um, some, some good lift to say that VR is feasible in this environment for the medical school. Um, in addition, and these were not things we expected, but um, nearly everyone th felt like they really improved their knowledge of how to use the defibrillator. And this is situated in a course where they were using it all the time in simulation, but since that was not the absolute focus of it, they were maybe not getting enough attention on how to actually operate the equipment. Um, and it really improved their confidence in using it. Um, so it was useful. Ooh, that's, that's me on YouTube. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, um, and the other thing is, now these, these are all measurements, you know, again, on survey and on the app, but in the future, we want to go to more hard measures for our next version, but, you know, their knowledge in actually in, um, the connecting the pads to the machine, which is, again, one of these sort of missteps, um, was greatly improved. Their comfort in, you know, predicting their future use of this in a cardiac arrest case increased. Um, and their mean time to defibrillation within the app um, as they played with it through a sort of time trial and under time pressure uh, improved from 106 seconds to 67 seconds. So they got faster at it. Um, we also collected information to see if there was any potential harm and side effects. Um, and there were a number of side effects sort of reported because we were very open-ended about it, but very little, uh, actually no real major side effects um, that occurred. Just a little bit of uh, dizziness and the most common thing was a little bit of fatigue. And then we collected a lot of qualitative uh, examples and just some more student feedback. Here's a few examples um, about how realistic it felt and th that they enjoyed going through this and found it intuitive and fun. So, um, you know, this is, again, just one example of, I mean, we've heard a lot of examples today of other institutions that are, you know, have kind of clearing houses or, um, facilities that can really facilitate, you know, VR projects. So in a way we're, you know, we're not reinventing the wheel, but we're, you know, at least uh, at, here at Columbia have collaborations that have started that are now, you know, pretty deeply rooted. Um, and the goal with this kind of co-laboratory is to continue to facilitate VR projects now, not just between, you know, myself and Dave, um, but amongst all you know, disciplines throughout the medical center and beyond other health, other health related disciplines, um, including, you know, of course, nursing, social work, um, hopefully occupational therapy and, and beyond. Um, we can keep, keep moving. Um, you know, uh, regarding our team again, so far, uh, you know, we, myself, Dave, you know, you see the three people, um, here uh, up on the screen. Uh, Columbia CUIT has been an, a great partner in um, promoting sustainability for us. Um, so we have near weekly meetings with CUIT. Uh, John Martin is an in-house developer. 
um, there who's worked very closely with us. Uh, we've now just started to get some consultant uh, developers working with us and now still have uh, a really steady flow of students, uh, mostly you know, supervised by uh, Professor Feiner here um, to kind of keep this sustainable. Um, so comments about it, I guess that's, that's all we have. Um, this is our whole, whole team. Um, I guess I shouldn't say whole team, but these are other components of our team and people who have contributed, including some of the students that we've worked with over the last few years. So thank you. We're going to save questions for the end for all the panel. Thank you. Thank you to the both. Next presenter is Dr. Jamie Panton. Uh, she's going to be talking about her project, Utilizing Virtual Reality for Pediatric Nurse Practitioner Students. Dr. Patton has 20 years of nursing experience and 15 years as a pediatric nurse practitioner. She is duly certified in pediatric primary and acute care. She has been involved in nursing education since 2012 and joined the Columbia University uh, School of Nursing faculty in 2018. She currently practices at Morgan Stanley Children's Hospital in the Pediatric Step-Down Unit, where she also serves as the Evidence-Based Practice Committee Chair. Please welcome Dr. Patton. Hi, everyone. Thank you for giving me 10 minutes or less to talk about um, my project for today. Let's see if I can figure this out sure which button to push. I'm mashing all the buttons. I'm not sure which button to push. Sorry about that. I push the same button. Okay. <laughs> That's why I'm a nurse and not part of the IT department. All right. So these are the objectives that I hope to talk to you about today. I did want to include um, a picture. This was our announcement that our marketing team put out. And this is my colleague and dear friend, Deanna. And she and I are working on this project together. And this was the first grant I've ever applied for, she's ever applied for, and it was the first grant that we were funded. So it took a lot of effort on my part to not print it out and put it on the refrigerator next to my kids' report cards, but um, I didn't. Anecdotally, they thought, oh, mom, won a grant. Can we have $500 of that money? I'm like, no, it's not the lottery. It's not quite how it works. But so our project is made possible by a Center for Teaching and Learning Emerging Technology grant. And so before I talk about the project itself, it's a bit important for me to talk about the background of the course that we are implementing this project in. So my colleague Deanna and I co-teach a pediatric emergencies course. This is taught in the final semester of our PMP and Doctor of Nursing Practice program. At this point in the program, the students have had the bulk of their, their didactic training and are actually getting ready to sit for nurse practitioner certification and licensure. So when we originally came to the school, this was a didactic course taught previously from my predecessor. But Deanna and I came up with the idea, hmm, if students are already basically done with their didactic education and they're getting ready to sit for boards, we've taught them the bulk of what they needed to know, how can we take this course and make it A, more fun, because students always like more fun, and B, more innovative. So we initially took a didactic course and, and converted it over, so to speak, to a purely simulation based course. And the, our current state of the course is, as you can see, this is from a YouTube video. Thanks, Juan, for sending me the YouTube video. This is a screenshot of what the uh, patient setup room currently looks like with HAL. Most of you are probably familiar with HAL, our pediatric simulator. And the person who you can't see their face, but this is Dina, and she's actually one of our embedded participants that works as the caregiver. So, and then you can imagine, as you all likely experienced, we came to an abrupt halt in 2020 from being able to come onto campus and use the Sim Center or any, or any other classroom on the campus. So we transitioned briefly to students at home using different virtual simulation programs like Oxford um, and Aquifer, Aquifer, but we were eager to get back into the classroom once the school opened up. 
So we kind of had this big idea, and it also was based on during that 2020 time, someone I think um, had mentioned the PALS course. I, for the first time in 20 years as a Pete's nurse, took the virtual PALS course and thought it was quite fascinating. So that in conjunction with our students being able to come back to campus, but at this point having already had some virtual sim experience from home, we thought, Where's the, is there a middle ground for this? What if we incorporated virtual reality into our pediatric simulation course? So we started with a literature review, which I'll touch on briefly in a second, but more importantly than even a literature review was talking to all the various teams that we have at the school. So as um, Dr. Kessler and his team said about Columbia and making partnerships and um, working with different groups, even within the School of Nursing and on the main campus, um, these partners of ours were really, really valuable in helping us launch the idea for this project. Of course, Dr. Bryant, Nancy, and Juan, and the simulation team are so amazing, not to kind of toot our own horns, but I really do think it's the people resources, not just the ability to have grant funding, but the people resources that have been huge for us because Deanna and I are expert educators and we are expert clinicians, but we are not expert researchers. So we really relied heavily on people who had more experience with researching this type of technology. And then, of course, Perixit and his team, I mean, I can't even work the clicker, much less figure out virtual reality, so really leaning heavily on our information technology team. And I will say both the Sim Center and the CUIT team, even before we applied for the grant, we sat down and met with everyone, and they said, this sounds like a great idea, how can we help you? Right, And so having that support and people believing in what you're trying to do, not only for your professional development, but for, for the students as well, was very, very important for us. And then so Kelly was able to put us in touch with Axon Park, who was the company that we're actually going to be contracting our virtual reality um, scenario creation with. And then because we want to look at the outcomes of this, and it involves using students, we are going to involve research faculty to help make sure we're going through the IRB process at Columbia, which I hear is a little bit daunting. Okay, so we, we met together preliminarily. We developed this grant, and in our search in the literature, there's a lot of information about there on simulation. There's a lot of information coming out about virtual reality. But what we're finding, at least in our arena as pediatric nurse practitioners, there's not much out there on nurse practitioner specific simulation. So when we first started looking, we kind of found these two buckets, right? There was a bucket that was very, you know, physician driven, and there was a bucket that was very bedside nursing driven. And neither one of those is exactly the type of provider that we're trying to capture with our core. So Deanna and I thought, well, what can we do to help kind of bridge that gap? What can we do to create some evidence to support the use of virtual reality for nurse practitioner and specifically pediatric nurse practitioner students? So we applied for the grant and we got it and that's where the real work will start to begin. So just to put it in context, this course won't roll out until the summer. And any of you who have ever tried to do anything at Maine Columbia know that this can be a months long process, just trying to get the legal piece situated, the finance piece situated. So we're still very much um, at the beginning stages of this, but we are going to be working with Axon Park. And so Axon Park's role is they will create a custom made virtual reality simulation, a one module, we currently have eight modules in the course, but one module for students to participate in on pediatric abdominal pain. And so the other modules that we have been using previously with our HAL simulated mannequin are things like asthma and seizures, non-accidental trauma, and in what we call emergencies that a nurse practitioner would possibly commonly see in an outpatient clinic, not just an emergency room. So we picked the abdominal case scenario because it seems to be the most straightforward um, for, in order to transition into a VR type situation. So Axon Park will spend many weeks over the next few months developing this custom-made scenario with us based on the um, video we provided to them of students that used the abdominal scenario this past summer with HAL. So Axon Park is taking our students' scenario that they did in July, and they will try to, as much as they can, build our virtual reality scenario similar to 
the way we're currently doing the scenario with the mannequin. So again, it's very much still a work in progress. We are aiming to submit this project to IRB by early spring in, in conjunction with our expertise from our research faculty. And what we're really wanting to look at is, so the students will all go through their normal HAL si simulation. Okay, they're broken down into groups of two to three students, and each one will have a HAL mannequin-based simulation scenario. Then we will give the students, we're not going to mandate it even though it's part of the course, but we're going to encourage students to each be able to participate in the virtual reality um, scenario. And we'll do a pre-test and post-test to see if knowledge acquisition using the mannequin versus virtual reality is similar. And our faculty that is a uh, um, that's the research expert, also recommended that we look at it from a qualitative standpoint too. And she has offered to conduct focus groups and structured interviews with some of the students who agree to participate in order for us to get a little bit more information about the student's perspective. So we're not just looking at comfort with VR and use of VR, you know, if they feel like technically they're able to, to have those skills, but we also want to look at their knowledge to see if the knowledge improves with the use of VR. And then our ultimate long-term goals are we want to publish what we find trying to go into it, not already thinking I know what the outcome is going to be. Um, but then we also would like to open up the abdominal scenario and any future scenarios to other NP students. Currently, the other nurse practitioner students at the school that are not in the PEDS program don't have access to this course. So it would be nice, especially for our family nurse practitioner students who will take care of children, um, that if we were to uh, um, create an environment in which they could also come be a part of the scenario too. And then big picture, if I did win the lottery, um, I would like to build out as many of these different modules in virtual reality as possible because it would, I think, like um, Dr. Kessler's study was saying, or someone had mentioned previously, the ability to go through the training over and over and over in a safe space. And any of you who work with kids know that can be a little intimidating to have to, to care for a, a child. It can be a little bit overwhelming. So we want to create um, an opportunity for students to feel like they can do that in a safe way instead of a, a literal physical screaming child at the bedside and an irate parent, right? So virtual reality kind of creates just this breathing room where students can explore and make mistakes where um, it's still safe for them to do that. And then because I, at least I personally, did not see a whole lot of information out there about VR and nurse practitioner education, we would like to work with groups who are working in the space of best practices and see what we can come up with in terms of what are the best ways to use virtual reality or any other type of XR technology in nurse practitioner education. Thank you. Okay, the next project uh, titled XR Learning Tools for Intraoral Local Anesthesia with Dr. Letty Moss Salentine and Sarah Samuel. Dr. Letty Moss Salentine earned both the DDS degree and the PhD degree in autonomy, autonomy at the University of Utrecht in 1967 and 1976, respectively. She joined the Columbia faculty as assistant professor in 1968 and is presently a tenured professor. In 1990, she assumed administrative responsibilities in the College of Dental Medicine, where she served as Dean for Academic Affairs from 1995 until 2015. In recent years, her administrative portfolio has changed to reflect her efforts in teaching innovations. She is a fellow of the Royal Microscopic Society in Oxford and a recipient of Columbia's Presidential Teaching Award in 2008. Sarah Samuel is a software engineer at IBM. She received her master's in computer science for vision, graphics, interaction, and robotics from Columbia Engineering in 2021. She worked as a student researcher at computer, Columbia's Computer Graphics and User Interfaces Lab from 2018 to 2021, developing AR, VR applications and interaction techniques. Please welcome the both of them. Oh, 
All right, so I, I am very ex oops, sorry. Uh, I am truly excited about the what I see as a convergence of of uh, you know, so really goals of what we are trying to do in education. Uh, I we we started in different uh, sites, different spots, but we are all seeming to work together, and I think this is really very great. Uh, the project that we are proposed, uh, really uh, discussing here is done by a team uh, which largely is done by uh, Dr. Feiner, who is already introduced here. I'm not going to ask <laughs> for another lengthy introduction. Uh, and, uh, and his team, uh, Sarah Samuel, was a, a student at Dr. Feiner's lab, and Carmine Alvisio was uh, another uh, long-term co-worker with Dr. Feiner. Uh, and then Laureen Bitzer and myself are from the dental uh, source, so we are a, a mixed group. Uh, essentially, this particular project started with a question. And the question was, how do we teach our dental students to give a, same, a safe injection in the lower jaw, which is a very tricky thing. As you know, dentistry is not a fun thing to, to, uh, to be subjected to, and, uh, and so you need uh, anesthesia. And essentially, the anesthesia uh, really deals with a, a fairly large number of, of fine uh, nerves, all of which are fairly easily reachable. Uh, and literally, uh, the, the injection for the dentist is not that difficult, except for the fact that there is no hypodermis. So uh, oh, those of you who have given an injection with an area that ha does not have, hy have hypodermis know how difficult this is. This is going to be very painful. The one area that we have where we have a problem is, is there actually a way to point here with this? Yeah, sounds good. Uh, what you're seeing here, this nerve. This is the one nerve that gives trouble. That nerve sits inside the lower jaw and has only a very small path uh, before it gets into the lower jaw where you can actually reach it to give an injection. And so the question was, how do you uh, take care of this? And essentially, uh, this is what you have to do. You have to uh, go from inside the oral cavity through a wall of muscle. Oops, that is the wrong one. So a wall of muscle, oh, hold on a second here, uh, let it be. A uh, wall of muscle in the cheek, go through it, and then you come in a space that you're seeing here, and that space shows you the nerve that you want to reach, uh, and then another set of nerves that you don't want to really reach, as well as a series of muscles. And that space is very narrow, it is a very narrow pathway. And so what you are looking at here is, a, a, Typical illustration of the textbook that shows you how you have to go into the oral cavity. You have to find a spot to uh, locate where you want to put the needle. And then you take the, the needle and put it in there so to go through the muscular wall and get into this narrow space. In order to do that, that narrow space does not allow you to go in from one angle. You have to kind of turn the needle. And that is the tricky part. The turning of the needle is uh, what, what is the most difficult thing to do. And that is what you're seeing here. Uh, this is the area we want to get into this location here. And this nerve is the one that is at this point going into the lower jaw. And so you have to do this nerve, you anesthetize this nerve, and hope that you don't do too much to the rest of the nerves around it. And here is the location that you have. This narrow space, this narrow gangway, is where you want to have the needle in. So you have to worry about touching muscles, touching other nerves, and the bone. So there is a haptic need also in this whole uh, virtual reality which we were trying to, to do. And so here it is. This is the uh, particular location you want to be at. Once you are in that narrow path, this is a series of muscles that you always also will encounter. Here is the bone, here are the teeth, and this 
muscle covers the area where the, that nerve is actually entering the lower jaw, and that is the, the area right here. That is where you want to deposit the anesthesia and then go from there. Sarah is going to go with the next bit here. So our goal was to create a physically accurate and instructive training tool that dental students could use to practice each step of the injection procedure and ultimately increase student confidence when it comes time for them to administer their first actual injections. Uh, our project has two components to it. There's a virtual reality component and an augmented reality component. So I'm going to focus on the VR system first. Um, so we developed this in Unity, uh, along with an Oculus Rift S headset. And on a high level, the way that the system works is the student puts on the headset and they can see an anatomically correct 3D head model appear in virtual space. The, the student also has a haptic device, which simulates the sensation of manipulating a syringe. Uh, and as the student moves the haptic stylus in physical space, they can see the motion of the haptic stylus mirrored in VR space in the form of a virtual syringe. Uh, so when they intersect the syringe with the virtual head model, they can feel haptic force feedback in the haptic stylus. And throughout the simulation, there's a series of visualizations that appear, which guide the student through each step of the injection procedure. So the haptic device that we used is called a 3D systems touch. Um, it offers uh, positional sensing and force feedback, and there's an integration between Unity and the Open Haptics API that allows for that mirroring of physical motion in virtual space. Uh, and there's a quick haptics API that defines a variety of force effects that can be applied to any virtual object in the scene. When we were developing the system, it was really important to us to get a physically accurate representation of what the injection procedure feels like to the dentist administering it. Uh, and we re relied on descriptions from Dr. Salentine and Dr. Zubiari uh, to really get a sense of the varying levels of resistance that one would feel upon inserting the needle. And the way that we approximated these levels of resistance was by using layers of transparent 3D model components, each with a different haptic effect applied to it. So to simulate the initial crossing of the needle through the mucosal surface, we used a shallow uh, game object with a pop-through haptic effect applied to it. Uh, then once the needle has been inserted, we needed to simulate a, a slight level of resistance uh, as the needle moves through the tissue. And for that, we used a viscous fluid haptic effect to get that slight level of damping. Uh, and finally, once the needle reaches bone, there's obviously a hard stop. Uh, and so we applied a constant force haptic effect to the object representing the mandible. Um, so throughout the simulation, there are four visualizations that appear that guide the student through the procedure. The first one is called syringe guidance. Uh, so we have that green uh, semi-transparent syringe there, and that's illustrating the correct initial position, orientation, and height for the syringe. Uh, so that green syringe will stay uh, constant in position relative to the head, and the student has to line up the haptic syringe with that green guide to ensure that it's in the correct uh, initial position. Um, at that point, the face material on the head fades to semi-transparency, which allows the student to see the key anatomical structures, uh, including the nerve itself. Oh, whoops. Trying to go backwards. There it is. Um, so because at this point the head is semi-transparent, the location of the injection site is ambiguated, which can make it difficult for the user to gauge how much farther they need to advance the syringe. Uh, and in order, in order to assist with this, we came up with this 3D progress bar, which indicates how much farther the user has to move the syringe forward. Um, so the progress is proportional to the distance between the tip of the needle and the injection site. And finally, the last visualization is a second guidance syringe, uh, which animates from the location of the user's haptic syringe to the correct final position and orientation. Uh, so just like the first time, the user has to line up their haptic syringe with the green guide. Uh, then they move the syringe slightly forward until the needle encounters that hard st stop haptic effect, uh, at which point the syringe flashes blue, indicating the end of the simulation. 
Um, all of the visualizations can be toggled on and off. And when we were actually doing our user study, once the students had gotten familiar with the system, we incrementally turned off the visualizations and ultimately had the students do the whole simulation without any visualizations. Uh, so that would be our closest approximation to an actual injection procedure. And now we have a demo. So the user can move the head in virtual space using the Oculus controllers and also fine tune the orientation of the head. So you can see them uh, lining up the syringe with the guide, moving forward, and then matching the correct uh, final position. It's going to go through it one more time a little more slowly. So lining up the syringe, moving forward. At this point, the head is obviously semi-transparent. And then lining it up with the end position. Uh, we also developed an augmented reality mobile app as an educational supplement to the VR system. Uh, this is a non-interactive 3D illustration of the procedure that consists of animations accompanied by captions uh, and highlights the relevant anatomical landmarks. Uh, the user can also adjust the transparency of the head in this app in order to get a closer look at the anatomy. Um, See, so this is a, a view from my mobile phone. You can see the relevant anatomy being highlighted for each step of the uh, procedure, and the syringe is animating to the correct positions. Um, and the user can use that slider at the top of the screen to adjust the transparency of the head. Uh, so now having described both systems, I'll hand it off to Lorene to talk about our user study. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to, I've taught at Columbia for over 30 years and the majority of the time that I've taught was working with third year students when they first start treating patients. So a lot of the studies that you're talking about are using at the end of um, the academic um, curriculum, this is actually used at the first. So we, dental students have, we've always used simulation. Students have practiced um, clinical preps on mannequins for their entire time. The one thing that we were not able to do was have students practice doing an inferior alveolar nerve block or actually any in, injection on a patient without doing it real time. So when students used to practice on each other, so can you imagine having a dental student who's never done this before give a fellow student an injection? So that was a little scary. So when I heard Dr. Salentine told me that they were working on this procedure and when I got to see it at the engineering school, I was really pretty, I was blown away. I thought that this was an amazing you know, experience for students to do. I was responsible for doing um, the study. Most of the study is using um, research data. We um, we, uh, we sent a survey to our upperclassmen to think back on their first experiences, and then we're using surveys on our dental students who are just starting to treat patients. Which, you just press this button? Okay. Um, so when I looked at the preliminary da data from our third years, it's actually very funny. They most felt very intimidated during their first IANB, and they would have liked a virtual reality experience, and they felt that they would have been more confident and their identity, ability to identify um, anatomic landmarks since it's a long time since they've taken an, their anatomy course. When we ran this project with our third year students, it's um, about six, it's pretty similar. 64% of students had never used a VR platform and only 30% of students felt confident that they could identify landmarks and even less students felt confident of giving an IANB on their patient for the first time. After we did this experience, we had students come to the office for 30 minutes. They could sign up on their free time. They did the AR and the VR. And after both of those experiences, 82% of students felt confident in giving um, an inferior alveolar nerve block for the first time. We tried pulling out data even to look a little bit more about the VR versus the AR. And again, we did survey questions on about how, you know, the, how they liked using the um, 
the AR and VR experience. I've only heard positive things. Students are sort of blown away by um, looking at it. They feel like, especially when using the haptics, when you actually feel resistance, they feel like, what do you mean I don't have a wall in front of me that I'm hitting? So it's really been a great experience and I can't wait to see what the full results of the you know, study show. Thank you. Can we have all the Columbia uh, Project presenters come up for questions now? There were some folks that had some questions. If you can walk over to the mic. Thank you for those great presentations. I have a question about the nerve block study. Are you you obviously have a chance to look at outcomes, which is fantastic. Right, is that what you're going to be doing? You're going to see whether those that went through the AR or VR experience for their first nerve block, you can tell whether it worked or not, right? So we are actually doing another survey at the end. So the students, the majority have never given an inferior alveolar nerve block net yet and some have maybe given one. And they've, the ones who have come into me have been very upset because the block either didn't, and anybody knows if you've gotten an injection and your tooth is still hurting when they're working on you. So we're working on that, but also, yes, at the end we're asking them after they have more experience to think about and reflect on how this has affected, you know, do they feel more comfortable doing inferior alveolar nerve blocks since doing this procedure? I guess what I'm asking is not whether they feel more comfortable, but whether the nerve block worked or not on real patients, because that's outcomes, which is yes. So, so we did ask. There's questions about how long it took for them to give the anesthesia and if the block took. The other thing, idea was: Do we actually, and in further iterations, do we have faculty evaluate the students for give, doing um, having given an inferior alveolar nerve block, having gone through this? Is it you know are they? more confident and the nerve blocks taking and things like that. Yes. Hi, yes, I had a question about the diversity platform. Yes, so in, it was a fantastic. And what I noticed is you talked a lot of, the simulation has a lot to do with becoming another individual. What kind of in user experience do they have when it comes to follow up with their experience as another person? We didn't start collecting the data yet for that, okay. uh, but the idea is um, we will try to see, to kind of like pair, not pair, but pick case studies strategically for students who don't actually look like the avatars to see like, you know, how that made them feel versus, again, students who do look like the avatar and see how would that be different. And is there counseling at the end of the Well, there will be program? a disclaimer that this could be triggering for some students because it, it can be. Uh, so we will address all that in our IRB saying that, yes, the students will have the chance to talk to the um, instructor afterwards. And we have two instructors. And, you know, bluntly, we do look different. So in case, um, because, you know, these things, you can have to, you know, look at things the way that you can't just sugarcoat things that they are where they are. So uh, we have the students, you know, if you feel comfortable talking with instructors, we also refer them to, you know, uh, counselors on campus. Um, so we'll be ready. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question, um, actually for everyone. It sounds like you guys, uh, first of all, thank you for a wonderful presentation. I, I was so inspired by everyone. Um, it seems like you guys all found amazing collaborators that you guys are able to work on this together. I was wondering if there are anything that you guys want to give us as an advice, what worked for you guys as good collaborators and things that you found that it's not working and you advise us to avoid. What if we sort of start with David and then go to you and give us a little background? Yeah, life is too short to work with people you don't enjoy working with. So <laughs> I, I think, uh, you know, 
probably I just like when it comes to Rob or, or Steve, we just keep dragging each other to everything. So I think even for this talk, we had to drag each other up there <laughs> um, because it's very inclusive. And I, I, I mean, I tend to work with people who don't see walls and this is a great group at Columbia, but even this conference is about let's break down even the walls between our universities and figure out how we can collaborate better together. So those are the kind of people I'm drawn to. I'll echo that and just say, you know, of course, there's some like natural attrition or selection where, you know, if people don't, you, if you tend not to work well together, it just, you know, it kind of naturally, um, you know, just doesn't work out. So um, when you do find people that you work really well together, it becomes quite easy. So. I will add to that kind of in the similar way is we should be people that other people want to work with. Yeah. Right. So when I'm mentoring students who are going to get their first jobs, like you have to be someone that is um, that is kind and that is patient and that is understanding because it, it's difficult to want to collaborate with someone who isn't like that. And I don't mean to sound Pollyanna and maybe my southern hospitality because I'm from Louisiana is coming out. But I do think that's important in maintaining relationships is that it's not just about you and you getting a grant and how can you make yourself better. But if, is there any mutual um, beneficial relationship for the person that you're working with, too? And I do think some of that just starts with being nice to people. Obviously, I will second or third all of that. Uh, one other thing to mention, and that's from the standpoint of the students that I work with. Um, it's one thing if a student goes home to their parents or their friends and say, well, I'm working on developing interaction and visualization techniques for augmented and virtual reality. It's like, and the parents will go, huh? Right? <laughs> but if you say, I'm working on trying to make it possible for medical students to be able to go and perform certain procedures with more confidence, to do a better job, that they kind of understand because we all know about doctors and dentists and other folks and the fact that maybe we'd like them to be able to do the best job possible. So I think that makes it very appealing to the students that I work with because they are both learning the things that I just you know, gave you that kind of not particularly passionate rendition of in the way in which other people wouldn't really fully understand it. Um, and yet at the same time, they're also doing something which they can feel good about it because it's really, it means something to society rather than the low level technical explanation. Um, I, I, from my experience, I would say work with someone who is on the same page with you on, on your agenda and believes in the same thing. Um, so I don't have a collaborators on this project per se, but I can, but I can tell you that working with the emerging technology team, like, you know, I met with Brexit before I even like, you know, put the proposal together for my grant and my, my project and it made the biggest difference ever. Working with them, they told me about what options to, to, to look at, the, the, the products, the companies, it was all Brexit. And then I worked with his team, Sue and John, and they, would, they made the biggest difference ever in directing me. It's like, oh, this is a good idea, this is a good product, this is a good, use that. So know your people and know, you know how to use them, I guess. It sounds like my story. Uh, when I when I was starting to, to think about this problem first, uh, I, I got a provostial grant, which I really am very grateful for because it made it possible to get started. And then very quickly, I I got contacts with Parixit, with Manisha, and you know, and and we started talking. They they led led me to different people. Said try talk with this person, try talk with that person. In the end, we all agreed that I would talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I had an amazing time working with Dr. Zubiari and Dr. Salentine. Um, so much of our project was making sure that things were physically accurate, both in terms of the anatomy and the haptics. And I am not a dentist, and so I had no idea um, how to gauge those things. And so I asked them so many questions and really relied on their descriptions that were very detailed. Um, and that was a, a huge part of the implementation for our project. Um, and they were super um, communicative and, and willing to help me, with, help me out with that. So I was got into this project very late. The team had already been working, and then they were looking at a way to you know, use this clinically. So I was really excited to work with them, and I really felt welcome for somebody, for a, new, for a novice who knew nothing of what was going on. But it was really such a great experience working with everyone, for Sarah and Carmine, who's not here, and Steve. And of course, Dr. Salentine, thank you so much for inviting me the first time to do this. Yes. 
Oh. I just feel. Do you can hear me? Yep. Yep. I am just. I just feel like it's a homecoming for me. I was a member of Columbia University, also as a professor, assistant professor in nursing, and graduate of Columbia University Teachers College. So it feels like home, and I'm so pleased that you continue the tradition of scholarship and a collaborative community. So anyway, my question is for the anesthesia. I think I have two questions. I wanted to ask, did you have a measurement of the knowledge uh, retention or decay after using VR with the defibrillator? Because I'm really curious about using that. And second is, would it be able to uh, do the apps to the mobile phone also? So in order to spread it through the community as well. Start with the first piece. Um, this was, that was our pilot project last year, and we're, we're doing further developments of the app with that feedback, and our plan for this year in the Ready for Residency course is to actually conduct a comparative efficacy trial, a randomized trial, comparing the app to an alternative, uh, such as a 360 video or in-person. We're still debating the details. <laughs> and with that, the course has multiple simulations throughout, and we're hoping to look at some retention of time to defibrillation throughout each repeated simulation. Um, as to the, the mobile app um, and the ability to port from what we've done to another application, I'm going to turn it over to Steve, I think, to speak more about that. I think it certainly could be ported. Obviously, it's one thing to be wearing a headset and have both of your hands free to do stuff, and another thing to be using, say, a mobile phone and have to hold it in your hand and look at the screen of the phone as opposed to look at the virtual thing that you're manipulating. Um, no, I am not a physician. I've never used a defibrillator. My guess is, given that this seems to be a very uh, time-rushed process, that probably the people using it are plugging things in. Probably one hand plugs in this way, the other hand does something else, right? That's certainly what I set up my computer, right? And if you had one hand holding a phone, it might be a little difficult to simply intellectually understand that as opposed to actually practice it. Oh, I, I was just going to say, I mean, it really speaks to the notion of like selecting the right, you know, modality for a particular task. And like we've seen like a huge spectrum here. So some tasks are, you know, really well suited for mobile VR, others aren't. Some are suited for mixed reality, others aren't. I mean, and I think it's important to try to estimate the percentage of knowledge or you know, attributes that you're trying to achieve. So certainly while holding it, we may be able to not achieve 100% of, you know, the knowledge and skills, but maybe 98 and that's good enough. But maybe it's 50 and that's not quite good enough. Um, that's, those are things we can study. The only other thing I just wanted to say is that as it, as it regards to sharing, that is our goal. So, and one reason that we started simple with just that simple task is not to get too complex and build complex scenarios is that we can share this easily now across our campus in, in you know, medicine and nursing and a lot of the schools are going to need to know how to use a defibrillator in an emergency. And so just at least that basic, we're trying to build it in a modular way where it can just be transported to any one of you. One more thing about the use of a smartphone. Everyone has a smartphone. Everyone does not have a headset. Um, so all those things about boxes of headsets piling up, you're not gonna see a lot of boxes of current smartphones piling up. They're in, the boxes have been thrown away. The, the phones are in people's pockets, purses, whatever, okay? And the idea that if the application is free and easy to download and relevant to something that you need to learn, well, it could be on your phone, you could use it, if it works well, your friends probably who also need to use it have told you about it, right? And then you're going to use it because if it's good, your friends are going to know that it's good. They're going to get you to use it as well. And I mean, that's there's very, very low barrier to entry, just the time it takes to download the thing and actually try it out, as opposed to something where you did need to have a headset. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the audience? R Randy. So I, real quick from each of the teams, um, so as I kind of survey the, the field of, you know, there's, it seems like every other day there's a new company with a new medical app that's coming. It's like it's dizzying trying to keep straight like all these things and evaluate and do. And as I count, out of the four of you, three of you are building your own, one of, one of you is buying. So I guess the question for each of you is, what's the risk of your chosen strategy? So if you're building it, 
What concerns you about that? And if you're buying it, do you have concerns about that too? Should we start, start with David and Robin? Down. I mean, this is a ta this is an entire day in in and of itself. I think <laughs> um, certainly, you know, uh, I was just telling someone I'm doing a pro con debate at IMSH this year at the conference. That's pro con on should you develop yourself in academia or should you have a company you know develop for you. Um, I'm on the side of the former because that's what we're doing, and I think it provides autonomy. It provides you know if you have sustainability, then you can infinitely customize it, which you may not be able to do otherwise. You may be able to just do a one-off application that is produced for you as one, you know, standalone um, scenario or app. Um, but I, I mean, those are the basic considerations, and I certainly feel that the value of developing on our own, given that we have resources like, you know, Steve Finer, outweigh, you know, the risk of it. Certainly for my medical colleagues, it was free, except for their time, obviously. That's important, but they didn't, they didn't need to have a grant, which they didn't to actually go and do this. From my standpoint, this is experience, uh, learning from my students. And so if they did have tons of money and went out and had someone else do it, my students would have had the experience. So, and I wouldn't have had the fun of working with them. Just at a dental meeting, and they had a big dental simulator company, and they had one of the chairs that everyone could use. And I sat down, and he said, we have an inferior alveolar nerve block simulation. And I was like, oh, all right, let me try it. And I did it, and I was still, I, and I told Steve before, the dental simulation that you designed was 100 times better and more realistic than the one that was on a big company simulator. So that's just my take. Well, I'll speak to, since I'm the person that isn't developing my own, I wouldn't even know where to start with trying to develop something like that. So I leaned to the people who did have experience with that and said, hey, let me put you in touch with Taylor at Axon Park. The risk is that Taylor takes the money and absconds with it, but I don't think that's going to happen, right? That's why we're waiting on contracts and payment and legal reviews and lawyers getting involved, right? Um, I, you know, having not started the project fully yet. I can't say what I anticipate the risk will be, but just from our multiple hours worth of meetings, this process is very iterative. So Taylor is the VR expert and Deanna and I are the cl clinical experts. So if we say, no, we need this monitor to, re to read this heart rate and this vital sign, then they'll make that change for us. So I don't think it's like, okay, we're creating this and it's stuck and we absolutely cannot adapt it because that would be unfortunate. Um, but talk to me in a year, and I'll tell you if there was any major risk of giving the money to a different company. Okay. <laughs> uh, for my project, I found a company that um, they develop case studies specifically for diversity, equity, and inclusion. That's their whole thing. And that was uh, suggested by Brexit, so he told me about it. And I was like, it works for me. It works for my course. So, um, and again, talk to me in a year, and maybe I'll, I'll figure that out. Um, and we also don't have centralized funding to grow out internally either, so we have to always think about, okay, what are the resources that we have? What is the project entail? Can, is, is there something that we could sort of take off the shelf without developing? Um, and so it's just not on. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so it, it, it really depends on the individual use cases and the project. Yeah, just to add, I think the when coming in the planning committee coming up with the topic for today, this is one of the pressing questions, what is the most sustainable approach? And I think we've heard a lot of great examples today, and it's not either or, but ultimately some hybrid, you know, is, is probably what's best for sustainability. Yeah. We haven't even brought up IP. Oh, yeah, yeah that's, 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 that's a whole other, <laughs> we're not going to bring that up today. But I would yeah. say whatever you're choosing, right, and it's like, like, does it meet the need? Just like, does XR meet the need? Like, like what's the best way to accomplish the project? But also what's going to help the program, uh, not just the project. So what's going to happen next year for all of us is a question that you have to ask when you start and when you choose your partner. I know we're going uh, past 3 o'clock. I just want to make one point. Anyone that's starting XR in their institution, find people like this right 
these are the, these are our champions. They're patient. They're kind. They're understanding. I mean, just uh, I messed up with Rob, and I completely forgot about him, and left him off in communication. And he's like, "Hey, I, what tour are you talking about?" And I was like, "Rob, I am so sorry." But he, like, he was very understanding, right? Things happened. Um, but we, we want to have people that you could work with. This is really hard. This is brand new. There isn't a rule book that's, oh, we're just going to follow A, B, C, and we're done, right? This is, they're literally on the cutting edge. You need to find your champions, and you need to find people that sort of have the same nature and demeanor. And it's really been really amazing working with all of you. You've really moved the needle in your disciplines, and you really are true innovators in what you're doing. So I just wanted to say thank you. And then Kelly. All right, so this is the end of our presentations, but it's not the end of the summit. So um, I hope you will join us downstairs from three to five. We have a networking reception. We have, we have liquor, we have wine downstairs. And, uh, and we have some uh, appetizers. So please join us downstairs. And especially if you did not have enough time to visit our vendors, uh, please, um, if you can, if you still have some time, go downstairs and visit our vendors. And I just want to last just say thank you, because like I said, it took a whole team to put this together. Thank you to the planning team, Perixit, David, Steve, uh, for working with me to put this conference together. Thank you to Columbia Alumni and Communications, Donna, Sharon, Janice, we could not have done it without you, and the simulation team, Juan, Dr. Nancy Owen. Uh, I know, she just got her doctorate, so we're, we're happy to say that. <laughs> and uh, Marona and Steve, uh, and Devin, uh, Steve and Marona were not able to join us, but they definitely helped in planning this. And I just want to thank all of you. Thank all of you for coming out today and joining us uh, for this conference, and I hope to see you back next year. Um, I hope you walk away with some knowledge and some wealth about XR, whether you're just starting, sort of like us, or to help you improve your existing XR program. So, and thank you to our presenters. Can we have one last round of applause for our presenters? <laughs> Wonderful, amazing job. All right, so I'm gonna keep it short and sweet, and I hope to see you all downstairs. Thank you. No.